Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of Daffy's Roundtable. My guest for today is no stranger, you guys have seen him. How many episodes have we done? Like three, four? We've done two, two sets of two. Two, okay, yeah, so four, so yeah, so two shrimp episodes, two blackout episodes, if you haven't seen them, make sure you go back and listen to them. This man is a wealth of knowledge, which you will see today, but today we're switching it up completely. Theo, what are we talking about today? We are talking, once again, you got the strange bald guy back, <laughs> talking about invertebrates. Awesome. So, invertebrates, more specifically, we're talking about isopod isopods. madness. Yes, I, oh, I like that. I might name the episode that. Isopod madness. I like that. Yeah, I got it, man. <laughs> I got it. I'm feeling it and I got it. Awesome. So, we're going to dive into isopods. But before we do that, allow me to thank Exoterra for sponsoring this podcast and making this episode possible. Exoterra makes quality products for our pet reptiles to make them feel at home. Okay, Theo. Isopod time? Isopod time, yeah. Well, the first thing I want to... <laughs> Hit us, yeah, start us right off. Yeah, go two, ahead. Just two, two things. Like one, yeah, for any of you few viewers that are watching, I, I, I'm I, wearing a hat, not because I'm ashamed of being bald, but so that you're not seeing a bright light reflecting off my head. <laughs> that will distract you from this beautiful man's face. <laughs> you, I know you're here to see this man's face. It doesn't matter what I say. All the time, of course. You're here to see <laughs> fatty. So They're here for the good knowledge, yeah. man. Well, yeah, we're, we're multiple reasons. Multiple reasons. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the second thing, if if it ever sounds clunky, like my brain, as I've mentioned before, I'm a little bit of a burnout. I, despite having a bunch of ideas in my head, I like to have a few notes in front of me. So if there's ever any type of like awkward pause or anything like that, it's just me reading. I'm not a great reader. Uh, so that, that's my introduction to introduce the isopod that's going to tell you about isopods. The isopod that's going to tell you about isopods. I love uh, that. Yeah. Awesome. I love that. And no, yeah, it's, you know what? It's, it's, it's interesting. I, I, I like to keep notes sometimes, but sometimes I get so distracted reading them that I forget what I'm actually going to say. Every, every time we've had our podcast, I usually come with a lot of notes and just like me and you have spent so much time together. We're yeah. able to just talk. You and don't really end up using them. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to glance at them every now and then so that I don't forget anything because I don't want to be like after the recording be like, crap, I should have said something important. Because yeah. Uh, yeah, like if the, the blackout guide was one thing, but... The shrimp in this talk, like, I, I want to try my best to provide the listener with a sort of comprehensive of a guide to isopods as you can, as, as I can. Not that I'm an expert, but I do have a few isopods and, uh, yeah, I love isopods and I, I, love, I love sharing my love about isopods. Awesome. Okay. So isopod, that's what I'm going to call you for the rest of the episode now that you said that. So isopod, <laughs> let's start off by telling us. How many, roughly, I don't know if you actually have them counted or not, but roughly how many isopods, species, morphs, what are they, what do we call them? I don't know, I've, you and I have a science background relatively, but I don't even know. They're, they're constantly being declassified or like changing the classifications and stuff like that. The number of bins I have is <laughs> That's a better way to put it, number of bins. <laughs> probably less than aquariums, but probably 30 or 40 now. Okay. And each one has a different morph a different looking isopod there's definitely different species different care got different requirements but uh i'm i'm getting up there we're uh like i've gone through phases last year when i was doing te finishing teachers college i bought nothing i i bought no aquarium stuff no plants actually a few plants, a few plants. <laughs> but uh, nothing nothing sort of reptile or fish related this year, I'm back with a vengeance. That's okay, beautiful. And, uh, yeah, I've been uh, the expos now. Like, I go right for the isopods. Right for the isopods, yeah. yeah. And, yeah, like, I feel like the isopod, the isopod hobby has been growing. Absolutely. But it's just, like, it's a stable hobby, I think. Like, you get people that like isopods, like, definitely for reptile people, because they're, yeah. they're also good at, as a cleanup crew in terrariums. But you're, there's a whole group of insect people in particular insect or arthropod or whatever you want to call them and it's i've met a lot of aquarium people that don't have reptiles but like isopods because for me like and and this i've we talked to tristan today and he said the same thing they're like they are land shrimp land shrimp yeah, so yeah. it's like having a shrimp tank except you're not worried, worrying about water chemistry and 
And yeah, so so okay. So my first question was gonna be why isopods? Would would that be the answer to that? Why isopods? Yeah. So yeah. So what? Like someone recently told me, isopods to him are like Pokemon. Okay. And like, I, I think I might be more of a geek than you are, but like, I grew up enjoying Pokemon. And in Pokemon, like, they really push, you gotta catch them all. You gotta catch them all. <laughs> and uh, yeah, like, we all get that, like, sort of dark urge to be like, I wanna get everything. Yeah. I wanna get all the reptiles. I wanna get all the fish. I wanna get it all. Exactly. And that's when, especially as you're getting more experience, you realize that's not good. Like you need to like one, ideally focus maybe, but like there's a point where you have so many things that you're not providing as much care to everyone. To you can't. those things, no, exactly. And like, yeah, it's- I feel that way about the reptiles, right? Like when, when you first get into it, you're like, oh, new species, new species, new expo, buy another animal, blah, blah, blah. And then now sure. it's like, I'm gonna downsize, I'm gonna focus on a certain number of species that I really enjoy and that's, yeah. yeah, and, yeah. and then you can get the things that you want, maybe. You can mm -hmm. just take your time and, and move. But for me, I've learned, when I, I am running out of room for houseplants. Okay. Like, I, I have a lot of fucking, a lot of houseplants now. You can, you can uh, swear you're good. <laughs> but uh, isopods, you can collect a lot of isopods and still give them good care. Yeah. and you just you can like covet you can want and you can get and it's not that bad because i think the biggest like a sort of a good and a bad part about isopods is that they don't like to be bothered too much right like i think like as like a desk pet like having a terrarium on like a desk like your work desk or something where you can see them that's good but you're like once in a while, like you can pick them up maybe, like the big isopods, like once in a while, I'll pick one up and like just let it crawl on me, like crawl onto me, not like grab it. And, uh, but usually they don't want to be touched. And like one of my, like the, my natural history course at Carlton, like an awesome teacher. And he was like- Is this Mike Runs? Yes. <laughs> yeah, he's awesome. And he was like, don't ever touch a piece of wood in the woods. Yeah. Do you, if you take it up, you are ruining a whole universe under there. Yeah. And like us growing up, like, of course, you're going to be looking under, after, like under rocks. Especially you're when you're herping, you got to look under rocks and wood. Yeah, no, yeah. You, so there's a, like, there's a reason to do it. There's a reason not to do it. But for isopods, like, you want to be checking on them every so often. It's not something you have to feed every day. It's not something you got to take for walks. Yeah. It is an easy sort of secondary pet that will not be on. It will, they will be happy if you neglect them a little bit, like a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. there is too much love you can give isopods, but uh, yeah, for, for those reasons, I think isopods are good. Uh, most of them are pretty easy to breed. Maybe make a little money on the side. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I just think like, they're just, to me, like, I don't know, I put like symbols on things and stuff. And like, to me, they just look happy. Yeah. Like okay. they're a happy looking creature. It's like sort of the jumping spiders. They're starting to grow on me. Like are they? <laughs> they just got like a cute little face. And I know that sounds weird to sort of the layman or whatever, but to me, they just, no, they really do. I agree. I agree. Right, let me ask you this. You keep your ice pods mostly in bins, correct? Yes. Have you ever experienced having them in like, you said, like a desk bed kind of in a terrarium kind of vibe? No, the way that I keep animals, like I definitely try to maximize their health and like make them happy and stuff. But less of my things are for display. Like okay, they're yeah. more to like breathing breeding yes but also to like maximize their happiness functionality yeah yeah for sure like like you guys come over to my house and like all the glass of the tanks because it's covered with algae right and like but the fish love that oh, yeah, the fish fish probably are happier with that, with that yeah, yeah uh, so like yeah like i've got one tank in my kitchen that is my display tank i've got the coral tanks that i'm really starting to like try to like make it beautiful yeah but the rest of the way that i keep animals is less focused on what's gonna make me happy or 
like, yeah, no, no, absolutely, I'm that makes sense. Yeah. Focus on that. What makes them happy? Because that makes me happy, and right, that yeah. might sound sort of like I don't know, higher, like sort of preachy or whatever. Yeah. But that's the way I roll. And on the other hand, when you got so many tanks, it's a little bit easier when you're not trying to make the glass clean. And yeah, stuff yeah, like maintain that. the, the so beauty of it. No, for sure. No, I have never had them in a small terrarium to look at. Okay, so have you? I haven't. No, but well, I have them in all my terrariums, but I don't really see them because they have yeah. reptiles in there. No, but the reason I ask is, you know, when sometimes you have like an animal in a tub or a bin and then versus that same animal in a glass enclosure where you're walking by it every day and it's constantly seeing you in the room so those animals usually become less skittish and don't like so when i open isopod bins usually it's like you open it this they scatter you flip a, a, a cork they scatter i'm wondering if that's because they're in bins, whereas if they were in like their own terrarium setup and constantly being around human interaction they may actually be less skittish. What do you think? So, like when I, so you, you know it, but like when I say bins, it's transparent. Yeah. So when I'm walking by the terrarium, I would say that it's probably the same senses are going off as if it was, or sorry, when I'm walking by their bins, yeah. it's probably the same senses going off as, as if it was a glass terrarium. Yeah. Um, do you, like, it's one thing to be said about like trying to socialize a reptile. And like yeah. trying to make it more comfortable with you. Isopods, I don't know, but uh, one, I probably have a million isopods. <laughs> not, not a million, but a lot of isopods. Like I'm not working, it's like this sort of the same thing with the shrimp. I'm not working with individuals. I'm working with a colony. Yeah. So I think that, I don't know, having them, like say like you had an isopod terrarium in like the middle of a mall. Like, would that make them happier and more accustomed to humans, or would that be bad for them? Right. All well, more accustomed to humans and happier doesn't necessarily equate to the same thing, right? No, it yeah. it, it can. It can, yeah. It can for yeah. sure, yeah. but yeah, comes down to again, like always, back for me, like the philosophy, like, well, who am I doing it for? I'm doing yeah. it for me, but I'm doing it for them too. You're doing it for them? No, absolutely. Okay, so. When I asked you why isopods earlier in the episode, I don't even know how, how deep we're in already now. I feel like, yeah, anyway, <laughs> um, you said, you said they all have, oh, when we were talking about the species versus morphs thing, whatever, you said there are definitely different species that you keep mm -hmm. and they definitely all have different care requirements. When I started getting first getting into isopods, it was almost like there was a, not actually a wiki how, but it was almost like a wiki how care guide where it was like all isopods were put under the same boat. You need a dry side, you need a wet side, you need a piece of cork, boom, you can keep any isopod alive. Why is this not true? And what are some of the differences in care? If you could break some of those things down. Okay, so let's get into care then. Um, that, the concept of a wet and a dry side we we got to break down a bit because okay. that is Hit important. Me. Hit me. So, like, I'm like uh, an aquarium where everything is the wet side. Right. Or, like, even most of your terrariums are going to be fairly All wet standard. Side. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or, like, but then you got, like, bearded dragon tanks or, like, a leopard gecko and you need, like, a humid hide or something like that. Yeah. So that that is important. So when we say a humid, a wet side versus a dry side. And I, I want to talk about what, how to build the terrarium later, but like- Do you want to start there? No, I, this is maybe a good way to go. Okay. So like, this is an important big concept. And this is where like, I have trouble with the deli cups. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the deli cups are too small to have a wet and a dry side. Yeah, and just to break down deli cups, uh, you, you mean like what the isopods are sold in in stores or yes. at expos, or like the smaller size containers. Yeah. Yeah. So the smallest size container. Yeah. I'm not saying don't put them in there for, for transport, but I really, really think that that is temporary. There was one time where I left one in a container for too long and you know, probably like only two weeks and it just, it either is too wet or it dries out too quickly and both are bad. So just like any reptile, isopods need a place that is humid in order to shed. And even more so, isopods have gills. 
Yes. So they're a crustacean. They're a yes. shrimp. They have gills. And if those gills go dry, your whole colony is toast. So you need a, you need a certain amount of um, space in your terrarium or enclosure or bin, whatever, that is maintains wetness, maintains moisture. Uh, it, it doesn't need to be like, say like sprayed every day, but like that, usually you have like, when I'll talk about building enclosure, I'll have like the soil on the ground and then on the wet side, and it depends what, per, how much, like the species will determine how, or what type of isopod will determine how much of the enclosure I cover with moss, like sphagnum moss. Okay. Cause the sphagnum moss retains the moisture and keeps the 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 soil wet so when they need it which some need it more than others but all need it at some point they can let's all okay, keep going yeah yeah they can uh find that moisture um so yeah so different species like say like cubaris like everybody loves cubaris They're like the rubber ducky isopod that is like the iconic sort of it's one high, even higher grade than that, but that's a... What's that's, higher grade than rubber ducky? There are some types of cubaris, like at the, ex, at the insect expo, there was like a type, types of cubaris that were going for like $400. Wild. Yes. Wow. So I, I, rubber ducky, they're not the pinnacle. They're not, they're not even my taste. Sophia really likes them, but yeah. like I, for me, I'm starting to really dig the big Spanish isopods, okay. but uh, cubaris, which are like cave dwelling isopods from like Southeast Asia, need it basically constantly humid and oh interesting okay yeah like there might be some that appreciate a bit of a dry side but for the most part they like it like maybe not like like a swamp but i tend to keep like probably 75 percent of the terrarium moist um on the other hand, keep talking. I'm just going to turn the lights back on. <laughs> on the other hand, so the, the thing that's really getting getting my uh, desires going these days are the big Mediterranean isopods. So these isopods are like double, triple the size of um, right, like armadillium or any of the other regular isopods. And Can you give us an example of some of those species? So my favorite one uh, I love the most is Expansus. Uh, I think they are, quote unquote, the biggest by a third of like mass. There's Magnificus that I just got that Sophia and I just got at the expo recently. That you're gonna the video. Or, that yeah, that, we should plug that video actually. Stay tuned. No, well that's that that video will already be out before this. Um, if you want to know what our expo Theo was talking about. Go to my other channel, Daffy's Reptiles, and check out the Salon the Insects video. I think it's going to be titled, I Ate Worms and Bought Moths. Something like that. <laughs> yeah. So that'll be out as we're recording this. That'll be out tomorrow. No, so yeah, go check it out. Like the, the regular reptile expos, like they're awesome. Like they're a show to see. Yes. If you guys have not checked them out, the, ones in, the one in Toronto is awesome. We're getting one, thanks to this man, uh, routinely in Ottawa once a year. That one is sweet. But the the insect expo, like us us nerds, like we're really, we nerded out. Really psyched about. We nerded out. Yeah. I, I I will just throw in one more plug as well to all the lovely listeners. If you are in Canada and are planning to come out to any of the reptile expos, make sure you use the code Daffy three for three dollars off. This is a Daffy's Roundtable exclusive code. I'm not sharing it anywhere else. Only my listeners get it. So Daffy three for three dollars off your expo ticket. I've plugged enough. Back to Isopods. I thought that was exclusively for me. <laughs> well, you and the listeners. Yeah, I, Aren't you a listener? I, I got three bucks off. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, sorry, we got derailed there for a second, but yeah, 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 no, the, it's good. the big Spanish one. So Magnificus, these are big orange isopods and like I like orange and they are the biggest for length. Then I've got Hoffman Sagai, which around here are a little bit more common. Yeah, but those are fat, like, to me, those are, like, the dark versus the, those are the ones that are, like, almost a black back with the white skirt, right? Yeah, they, they yeah, they, some of them don't have white skirts, but okay. yeah, they, they are big and black, and, like, sometimes, like, I'll be showing my, like, normie friends the isopods, and normie like, friends bring out the Hoffman Sagas, and they're like, oh, yeah, because <laughs> closer to roaches or beetles than, they than do. the isopods, they yeah. kind of look like that, but yeah. they're still, still cool, and so, 
those guys need it drier. That does not mean the entire enclosure is dry. A lot of people I've seen online have the misconception that like it should be kept like a desert. All of these animals, like including like bearded dragons, a lot of these things, they will go to humid places at times. So they, all of these animals still should have that gradient. But for the big Spanish isopods, I have like maybe 25%, 20% of the enclosure as wet. And I am very careful that when I am adding moisture to the tank, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, the moisture does not creep into most of it. And a, way, a good way, like uh, these things, every the, all, all these things, plants, animals, they're going to talk to you. They're going to communicate. Like when you're lifting up an enclosure or like a piece of wood and they're all on the wet side, then they're telling you they want the wet. If they're all crowded on the dry side and there's not a single one on the wet side, then the enclosure is too wet. Too wet. Yes. So they're all trying to get away from it. Yes. That so they're self-regulating. It's just yeah. like like a snake going or any of them basking, finding heat when they need heat. Like it's instinctual. They will go yeah. towards what they need. So yeah, um, that is going to be like a general difference and an important sort of bigger concept to understand and put into your head as we talk is that um, like unlike... Like, I know, as I imagine most of your viewers are reptile people, but, like, with aquariums, like, you're looking at pH, you're looking at, like, how much minerals are in the water, and, like, some of these animals are coming from places where, like, the water's acidic. Some of these places are coming from, or animals are coming from places that are alkaline. Uh, Can I stop you there? Yep. Just because I'm going to forget, as you're talking, I'm coming up with so many yeah, questions. Yeah. Okay, so let's, let's just, let's stick to that point for a second. Uh, the pH and the alkaline and all that. Sorry, I'm just taking notes on my laptop. Yeah, yeah. So I don't forget oh, things. Um, so, like, I I've heard this the 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 use of limestone before. Um, I'm not sure if that's to change the pH of the soil or if that's something they're eating. And is there any isopods? This is gonna be a loaded question. Is there any isopods that do require a different soil pH or a different soil temperature? Or I know those are very drastically different things, but like I'm. You know, other than just wet and dry, I guess I'm asking, are there other specific differences per isopod species or locale or morph that are required? That is like a next level question. A loaded question, yeah. <laughs> it's, I, maybe. Okay. Like, I, I would say you wouldn't want soil that is like hydrochloric acid. Level. Right. Like, and you probably wouldn't want soil that is like from the ocean beach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but... I have not had trouble, like, other than rubber duckies, which I'll, some people will say will breed seasonally, all of my isopods are breeding like crazy. Okay. So I don't, and I use very similar soil mixes between it. For all of them? Yeah. Okay. Like some of them, maybe I'll add a little bit more of like the arid mix that you would get for, for like succulents. So like something with more sand. Yeah. Um, but I definitely am not adjusting the pH. Okay. It's an interesting thought that the, cr the coral would be increasing the pH of the soil. Maybe. Because you do give them coral, don't you? Yeah. So I, I do. I, not, Why? not a lot of people do. Yeah. But they benefit from having things to give them minerals particularly calcium and maybe when they're eating it and then they poop it out maybe that would slowly increase the ph of the soil i don't i've never really tested the soil of ph i think you with your wetlands ecology it, maybe you'd have done it I, I have that's yeah that's, that'd be an interesting yeah. thing to do like it would have the curious, soil. yeah but, I'm, I'm curious i'm i i I've thought about this in reptile keeping as well and i'm surprised that it's not a more common practice well some um, people like I, I definitely know that with some plants they prefer acidic water and some yeah. prefer more alkaline and yeah uh that's an interesting question but the other hand is that you're gonna have a lot of like leaves and moss and other stuff. Which also down. could affect as well, right? That would be bringing it down. Bringing it down, yeah, yeah exactly. So yeah. maybe you'd balance it out. I, that's a good question. And I would be very interested in testing some, like say we test 
my oldest enclosure yeah. versus a brand new one. Yeah, we should try that out. We right. can get soil test kits from like Dollarama. <laughs> like, really? They're like, yeah, yeah. They're easy to get. They're not like, they're almost like uh, in aquariums, you know how you have the strip tests yeah. versus like the liquid tests. And do you have to add water to it? Yeah, you yeah you, you put the soil and you mix it with water. Okay, because yeah. I have like just a stick, like a TDS meter that measures, measures pH. Okay, yeah, so, I think I have one of those as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, but let's, let's, let's play around with this. Yeah, <laughs> let's, let's try that out. Yeah. So, no, I with none of my enclosures am I keeping track of the pH, um, and I haven't really found anybody that does. Yeah, no, I'm not I haven't heard of well any research. But yeah. I don't, I don't think that that is extreme. I, I know it's not extremely important, but whether it has an effect, maybe. Okay. Yeah. And I want to, I want to, I want to jump to, to how to set up, how you set up your enclosures or building the, the, the bins, as you said, or any of that, but I, I just going to keep on this topic. We're not, well, not this topic, but something you just mentioned as well. Um, first of all, you said you, you, you think, you know, that bearded dragons and leopard geckos do require humidity. In my opinion, we're not keeping them, not just my opinion, I shouldn't say my opinion, like I'm some expert, but I don't keep bearded dragons or leopard geckos. But um, as I've been talking to more people and reading more about it, I, I do believe that both leopard geckos and bearded dragons aren't being kept humid enough. But as people are keeping them now in a more drier state, this is probably one of the most common questions that I hear about isopods is like isopods in arid vivariums. Um, and so as bearded dragons currently and leopard geckos are being kept, it's probably a little too dry, too dry for them. But is there a species that can, if we, if people were keeping them a little more humid, you know, giving them, like you said, the humid hide, et cetera, whatever, is there a species that you would recommend or do you think would actually survive and not just survive, thrive and breed and, and can you create a bioactive, and again, not using bioactive, I'm rambling, but again, not using bioactive for the term bioactive, but like, can you put a cleanup crew in a arid vivarium. Yeah, so like I no longer work at a pet store, <laughs> but I've worked at a pet, I did work at a pet store for a long time. Shout out Critter Jungle. Shout out Critter Jungle. Um, I have reptiles and all of my friends are reptile people, yeah. but I don't like, I. I like I am more of an aquatic person. Yes, I'll do. So I am probably the least informed, like other than like, I do like to listen to things. And whenever somebody smarter than me is talking, I do listen to them. I am- He's talking about me, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like I, I'm not, no, by no means an expert. I have seen more and more people keeping bearded dragons and leopard geckos and those guys that don't actually live in your beautiful sand deserts mm -hmm. on soil. Yeah. And so if you kept them on soil and you had one side where the soil, where the soil is more moist and yeah. especially you have like a water dish under that water dish is going to be moist. Yeah, be moist yeah. So say with my ball pythons, which are not, I don't know a lot about pythons. My ball pythons are, much more of a temperate tropical animal than bearded dragons. Right. But I still have like a more humid place and a drier place. And I still find them mostly chilling under the water dish. I think they're still eating poop and stuff like that, doing the things that you want them to do because the colony continues to grow, especially in a ball python tank where the ball python is not eating the yeah, isopods. Yeah. But they definitely need that place at least once in a while to find humidity. Okay. Um, what types? I've heard a lot about powder isopods. So I think they're pronosis, something like that. Pronos, pr pr Priscilla pronosis, I yeah. think. Yeah. Or Priscillianoid something. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can just look it up. Yeah. Like those guys, I think they are very good at handling a range. Okay. Uh, That's, it's interesting you say that. I actually have them in a lot of my tanks. Yeah. And so they handle a range, I, I think. Lavis, which there is goes. my number one, or like, like I've probably produced like 10,000 dairy cows. Um, they do like it humid, but 
I think that they are also very strong isopods. Porcelionoides prenosis. Yeah, porcelionoids. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's the powder orange or powder blue. Yeah. And then dairy cow or anything lavis, it, it, and like orange, whatever, they're, they're lavis. And those ones I think are also really strong. I use them in more tropical enclosures. So I'm not sure how well they do in a leopard gecko or greater dragon enclosure, but that's another cheaper one that is a good cleanup crew. The, the best cleanup is usually springtails and, and dwarf isopods. Yes. So they're good because I think they clean better than any of them. They breed very fast. And uh, what's the other thing? They're small. So like in my crested gecko tanks, I don't have many crested geckos, uh, <laughs> they're not getting eaten. Whereas if you're putting powder isopods or lavis isopods and you got like a predator lizard in there, they're probably going to be taking them out. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so I think the best ones are those four that I mentioned. Whether you can keep springtails and uh, dwarf isopods in a semi-arid environment, I don't know. So, but what you're saying is a bigger factor than it being a specific temperature or a specific dryness or whatever, as long as you do have a wet side, is really the fact that it's the substrate, a soil versus like a sand, whereas if like, you don't think they'd survive on a sand. Then... I do not think they would survive on a sand. Okay, yeah, like, very interesting. They're, they don't want their gills to dry out. Right, yeah, yeah. And uh, it's cool actually, I just saw Dune and Dune, like <laughs> there's these, actually, I'm not. Gonna... No, no, go, go down there, yeah, yeah, like, do it. Okay, so just, I'm not gonna spoil Dune, but if I've read Dune, like it's the same thing. They've got these giant sandworms, okay. and the way that they get these sandworms to actually like ride these sandworms into battle, okay. they're like pulling up the scale with like these hooks, and so it exposes their gills. Okay. So they don't want their gills to get sand in them. So that's what keeps the worms above the sand. Above the sand. So really. I don't know. That's just a kind of aside, but. I don't think isopods and sand work. Maybe yeah. there's a desert isopod. Everybody's always after that cleanup crew in the in the desert. So I asked a question. I've heard of something called um, a fire brat. Mm. I think that's what they call it. Mean, probably the common name or something. And those are supposed to be like the isopods of the desert. Okay. Um, but I have not been able to find them anywhere. I remember James talking about something that's coming out that's going to be the sort of cleanup crew for the desert, but yeah. I'm not sure. I think... Coming out. New movie dropping. <laughs> that was a while ago, too. So it ain't here yet. No. But uh, no. no cleanup crew for a desert enclosure. That's not my air exp expertise. I.e. mealworms, probably. The, yeah, yeah. The Darkling beetles. Yeah, a lot of beetles. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that's coming up into another thing, like... Some people will say any of these cleanup crew have a potential of hurting your reptile. I don't believe it. Whether that's true, I don't know. It doesn't make much sense to me. No, I don't that, believe it. Uh, like, yeah, it, it doesn't make much sense to me. People, I've even heard some people say that dwarf isopods will eat big isopods. That was my next question. Yeah, so the, we'll get to our... Uh, yeah. Unwanted guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eventually, but uh, I I don't think so. I, I don't think so. In my experience, working at the pet store, because mm -hmm. that's where I heard it the most. Mm -hmm. um, and once you start asking questions, and you start down the direction of okay, when was the last time you saw this animal alive? The usual answer is it's been a couple of days, and so my belief is that this animal died and then the isopods are getting all over it and that's what people are seeing and blaming the isopods yeah, for well, yeah, that, so that makes yeah yeah if the animal is dead then yeah of course these that's what they're designed for they're detritivores that's why they're not they shouldn't be going after living things because they're not designed for it okay so on that note do you have them in with your crested geckos when your crested geckos are laying eggs or with your ball python when they're laying eggs yes do you believe it's another controversial question. Do you believe that uh, isopods are eating eggs? Fertile eggs? I, d I don't know because when I am in the, I am no longer breeding crested geckos. 
two years ago when I finished breeding Crested Geckos. I I did it for years where I dig out my nice bioactive enclosure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't. I didn't do that. I had it like I gutted the, the tank. I remember this. Yeah. Yeah. So I gutted the tank. I but well, like I still had like all the same cork branches. It's still full on the top, but the bottom was sterile. Yeah. Was not sterile, but like a paper towel that I would be replacing, and I'd have a lay box. Okay. So I didn't have isopods in that time. Yeah. When I have the when I when I do have my bioactive tanks or bioactive whatever quote unquote, um, and my crusties are laying infertile eggs, I do find them full of holes with yeah. So infertile eggs. Yeah. So yeah. So I I don't know like I I have never and uh, yeah I shouldn't I shouldn't be speaking in like such that like facts or I'm sure that it's not the case. But in my experience, um, I didn't go your route when I was breeding I was, uh, crested geckos. I had them in their bio, and I would go looking for the eggs and destroy the tank every time I wanted to find the yeah. eggs. So they were laying them in the soil with isopods. And as long as the eggs were fertile, so if the, egg, the geckos were paired, the, the six to eight months after the pairing, not never a problem. Mm. And then once it's been like, whatever 10 months and it's been a while since it's been paired and the eggs are probably coming out infertile at this point yeah i find them damaged or with holes or something in them but i don't necessarily and this is just my opinion um i don't necessarily think that ice balls are eating fertile eggs yeah no like most of the time i'm going to agree with statements like that yeah i think that there's a lot of misconceptions in the hobby uh, in all of these hobbies and let's talk about people... super worms breaking out from inside of gnomes yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so there's but on the other hand, I don't get surprised very often. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it would not surprise me if a starving isopod tried to eat an egg. Right. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. Uh, for me, who, despite have, having re have had reptiles for a long time, I play it pretty safe with the isop with reptiles mm -hmm. so i'm not as super comfortable like taking risks yeah whereas with tent with aquariums i like i live and breathe it yeah so like i'm able to anticipate things better and when i'm seeing problems if i ever see problems i am adjusting um whereas like with like that, that's why like i wasn't taking chances of like the babies hatching in like too deep soil or just any of the millions of things that could go wrong yeah, yeah i yeah. just wanted them into a lay box and then me taking them out of the lay box and putting them into as perfect of conditions i can get i like guess basically babying but, the eggs as much as yeah, possible yeah no and that's a good way to put it like mm -hmm. I, I was baby i baby reptiles because i'm not as comfortable like with variants mm -hmm. um but if i were to if i was a betting man I would agree with you. Yeah. I, it doesn't make as much sense to me that they're going after something that's living rather than leaf litter or ice feces or like the carrot that you're putting in or something like that. Yeah. But maybe. Yeah. Who knows? And then the other way to look at it also is if isopods are everywhere all over the world in the wild, you find isopods everywhere. How are species reproducing and keep going if, I just watch and keep eating all the eggs, right? Yep. Like that's another like yeah. Oh, it's a good point. In in yeah. captivity, like captivity is not the wild. Obviously, we are concentrating Obviously. them. Of course, yeah, and yeah. we like in the wild, you have all these populations that just die off because like it dries out or they run out of yeah. food or something like that. We're we're often not letting that happen. Yeah. So, it's a good question, and I would say that's a question for reptile people not, to, <laughs> okay. not, not your humble isopod guy <laughs> just your humble isopod yeah so you are isopod today so we kind of jumped around back and forth yeah. we talked about a bunch whole bunch of different things but maybe we would like kind of fo streamline the conversation a little bit yeah. so you said so the, building tanks hit yeah. me with the building so the, tanks this portion. is the way i wanted to lay it out as sort of like your timeline of like getting and keeping isopods okay so the box the box so, like, we we already sort of touched on keeping them in a, like, as sort of the secondary 
in inhabitants of a terrarium. Right. And we can go back into that eventually. But what I see a lot of people doing is the isopod is your focus in the terrarium. Yeah. Especially when you're getting like the expensive isopods where like each isopod is 10 bucks. You don't want them eating. You do not want them eating. Yeah, <laughs> you no, do not. Sure. That is an expensive snack. Uh, and not a very filling one. So, um, I use a lot of plastic bins. They're cheap. And I think they're just as effective as anything else. Yeah. Uh, some people will say that, and maybe this is true, maybe it's not. Glass doesn't hold humidity as well. I believe that. Yeah. And then the other thing would be that you can't, it's going to be a lot harder to put holes into the glass yeah. as in a plastic container. For sure. So for me, I used to get th more things at the dollar store. I find that I think the dollar store things are just crappier and that makes sense. And they break pretty uh, fast. Yes. Yeah. Um, for me, I am looking for deals at mostly Costco. Okay. Like last time we went to Costco, I was like, bins! <laughs> and I bought 12 bins. <laughs> okay. Because uh, they were at a good price and they were good bins. Uh, but like, um, we went by Ikea a little while ago. There's a bin like district at Ikea. Like there's That's like crazy. 30 different types of bins. Okay. And more expensive, but nicer. And so I use bins. I like bins. They're not the most like beautiful. You're not going to have like a display bin, but... I use bins. Um, a display tank, all the rest of the concepts that I'll talk about still apply, but most people keep them in bins. So you got your plastic bin. For a small colony, I'd recommend, you're not gonna, most people are not gonna see my hands, but like a shoebox size, basically. Yeah. I wouldn't go smaller than a shoebox size. Okay. Uh, that's a good for every isopod, except for, in my opinion, the giant isopod for a starter colony. Because you still got this long vertical, like, the, the horizontal space that you can have a wet side and a dry side. Mo a lot, some of my colonies, sorry, wean it down a notch, some of my colonies have outgrown those bins. So I have needed to move them into a double shoe box and then on top of that, an actual bin, like a bin you would store things in. And you gotta make space for them, but they stack really well they are meant to stack really well yeah uh so that's bins are clear bins or colored bins i use clear okay. i i don't think it probably no like i wouldn't do colored like imagine your life that your entire life is you're seeing blue or something like and you're that. always in darkness yeah yeah and more shaded and like yeah. i would definitely not recommend like a black bin where okay. you can't see through it right um some of the isopods maybe come from caves where they are literally never seeing light, but I I don't I don't know that and I don't like that idea to to make it like for me every animal should have like choices right so if absolutely. they want to be in the dark there's tons of dark areas under the hides yeah under the cork bark but to take the ability to take light permanently away from them that doesn't sound quite right to me. Although, what do I know? Um, <laughs> so, some people say they are better in smaller enclosures. Yeah, we've had this discussion before. Yeah, I generally disagree with those comments. <laughs> like, I was told, I I'll tell you what I was told. I was told they run into each other more, yeah. so they breed more. Often. I don't think they need to run into each other all the time to yeah, get pregnant. To, to get yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Like, uh, I just... Sorry, I need to sip a beer. Yeah. Um, I don't keep my, I don't like my small cultures. The way that I make it so that they run into themselves more on a call, like say I buy like a really fancy isopods and I'm only able to get six of them. I keep them in a shoebox, but I only have one or two hides. Right. So then they're going to find each they're other. They're going to find each other. And that, we're going to get into behavior, but isopods like to be together mm -hmm. like it's one like the survival in numbers thing but two there's actually a word that i can't remember it starts with a th it's a very sciencey word they like to be touching each other okay um and that is why like they're also another good animal to keep in captivity because they like to be in large groups yeah yeah, yeah. i wouldn't put like a million isopods into a shoebox but just like shrimp 
they like to be together. They like to be in larger populations compared to say like putting five bearded dragons in a tank yeah. or like putting a million guppies into a five gallon tank. Right. Like they're, they all have limits of how many dudes they want to be running into on a daily basis. Yeah. But I am often, and maybe I'm privileged because I've got a, I've got a room to put all of my things in. I've got a couple of rooms, yeah. but uh, I would recommend not having a tiny enclosure. One for the ability to have a gradient of humidity, and two, I just it doesn't really make sense to me. Like in the wild, these things aren't living in like a tiny cube. Right. Like yeah. and I don't know. I've I, I too have sort of got into arguments about a couple things, and I just I'm not super passionate about it. But like, I just don't think it makes sense to me it makes well, i mean everything bigger is always better right there's a limit like there's a limit like if you if you threw six isopods into your entire basement yeah then yeah they're not gonna find each other yeah potentially even though maybe they have pheromones maybe they'll be able to find each other but uh no for me i like a large bin or like a medium bin or large ideally a larger bin one question on that before we jump off the box itself <laughs> Um, how do you determine how much ventilation you need to put in there? Okay. So yeah, that was the ne that was the next thing I was talking about. Yeah. Um, I've just, like at first like I've always like I I am not like I'm I'm a jack of all trades like a master of none like I like to be handy yeah. I like to do things around the house I like to get the tools out and do things yeah but uh, I grew up with a father who was an engineer who would cut like or who would measure like five times and then cut. And that rubbed off on me in a negative way, whereas <laughs> I don't measure. <laughs> okay. So a lot of my holes, like when I'm cutting big holes, they're kind of wonky. Yeah. But um, I see like some people who like are really fine with it, like like say Greg or James, like they got that eye for accuracy. Yeah, yeah. And that might benefit, but uh, it's not what I do. I tend to, I used to, you like, you, you can get like a whole drilling device. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm being very stupid, but like Dremel. No, like like a drill. <laughs> yeah, it's on the end of a. It's a drill bit that okay. has like a circular piece. Okay. With teeth on it. Okay, I know what you're talking about. And yes. so yeah. it's 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 called like a hole cutter or something, something simple. And like I do have one of those, but I don't know if it's the cheap plastic that I'm using or something, or maybe I'm just not skilled. I'm always. I used to bust holes into the thing and it would crack. Almost cracks, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I see a lot of people on your line using it. I'm not using that. What I used to use, and when I just need to put a couple smaller holes, I use the, what I learned from you guys, is the soldering tool. Soldering iron, yeah. So super, super hot tip. I do it in my garage. You know, the other day when I did like 15 bits, I think I poisoned myself a little bit. <laughs> uh, I just like, poke holes into it yeah and i used to actually use a soldering uh like soldering gun they call it but it's like it's a stick it's not a gun um to drag it along the top and cut like a, a square. square yeah that takes a long time i found a soldering gun with an exacto knife on the end okay nice yeah so it's like an exacto knife that is super hot Okay. And it does take a little, it still takes time, but that's what I use to cut the hole on the top. Okay. And the way that you're cutting your holes, I would say depends on both the species and where you are putting it. Okay. So say like you are stacking all your bins vertically. Yeah. You're going to want to put them on the sides. Right. With me, like I have like spacers between them basically. Yeah. Like a rack. Uh, I'm cutting one hole on the top. And that will, and then along the sides, I have a bunch of holes on one side and very few on the other side. Okay. So you're still creating a constant cross ventilation. But I like think cross ventilation is still important, Yeah. but that allows me to have that big hole and the bunch of holes on the dry side. And then mm. the smaller amount of holes on the far side. Okay. That makes sense. For the humidity. Um, Cubaris, I'm not putting that giant hole on the top. 
I'm just okay. putting holes on the side. Because those are the ones you said preferred and like they come from caves and they preferred more humid. Yeah. The thing you got to watch out for, unfortunately, is that, which we'll get into eventually, but it comes up right now. If you don't have, so when I've got that big hole in the top, I'm gluing with a glue gun mesh, mesh onto yeah. it. Like it's like a screen, mm -hmm. like you would get at Home Depot. Screen. The screen mesh or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So I glue that onto it. I've on some of mine I've been proactive enough to glue screen onto those side holes. Okay. But most of mine I don't have. Them. I do that as well, yeah. Yeah. So if you've got holes in the thing, stuff is gonna get in. Oh get in. Yes. That's what your worry is. I thought you were gonna say you found isopods walking all over your house. So isopods most isopods don't climb. Okay. Except for dwarf white isopods. Mm. The dwarf isopods will climb right up the wall go out and get into the bins that are beside it. Okay. And I did find that. Okay. I had like, literally like, I, I always keep them in the same place, dwarf isopods. And like the three bins beside it had dwarves in them, which were, and they were with other isopods. And then beneath it, I have an aquarium with a lid. It's a bunch of dried dwarf isopods oh, on top. Wow. Okay. So they can, the dwarf isopods will climb and they will get out. They will get into your terrarium whether that is a really bad thing or just kind of an annoying thing, we'll talk about later. But basically the concept is when you have open holes, you can expect things like fungus gnats and so the flying dudes and dwarf white isopods to get in. I don't really think other things will like might say or like anything like that. I don't think they're going to be able to do that. But um, I would argue that if mites can get in through the holes, they can probably get into the screen mesh too. Yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good point. So yeah, so uh, if you if you want to be really careful, put screen on everything. Yeah, that's what I do. I'm not a big. I don't fear dwarf isopods a lot. So if it happens, eh. But uh, I don't put screen on everything. I'm putting screen on that big hole in the top, and then I'm puncturing little holes along the sort of top of the wall so that big isopods can't get out or, or the, the isopods in the terrarium can't get out because they're not going to climb. Um, but it's possible things are getting in. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's how I make my bins. Awesome. This, the same like sort of concept that the dry and the wet side would apply to your glass tank. Um, but you're going to have to just figure out a way to keep one side more moist more and humid. one side heat. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so awesome. So off that, we'll probably jump into like the most important topic in ice pods that's like very heavily being talked about right now, which is substrate. Yeah. So substrate. So I like sort of when I was into shrimp or like when I was first getting into shrimp, like I like to use as everything basically. Yeah. You've talked about some, and Sophia's talked about some interesting stuff, like this stuff, flake soil. Yeah. That sounds really interesting to okay. me. Yeah. You've also, but you haven't used it. No, yeah. I've never even seen it. Okay. Or I, maybe I don't even understand the concept, okay. but you've also showed me pictures of people grinding up cork. Yes. If I knew how to do that, I would do that. Yeah. yeah <laughs> Cause that yeah. sounds cool. Yeah. But, uh, I don't use either of those things, even though, and to, because I have so many things, like I probably would only save that type of premium soil yeah. for the higher end stuff. The highest. Yeah, that makes sense. But uh, yeah, so I've got a few things that I mix in and I mix it in like a big container and then I put it into the terrarium. So before that, like I would say, aim for at least a two or three inch layer. Okay. That, that I think is important. They need to be able to dig. Some dig more than others. Some will actually like dig out a little hole and have their babies in the hole and defend the hole. No way. The big, dude, the big isopods are really cool. Okay. They've got a That's lot awesome. of characteristics like that. Yeah. But, uh, what was I saying? I got two or three inch deep soil. I think that's a good idea. Okay. And that becomes more difficult to achieve when you have a, a small enclosure. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I would say like you need some depth to the enclosure, whatever that enclosure may be. And when you are adding soil, I would aim for about a two or three inch layer. 
um, you need to be able to dig. And just like you would find in the wild, the top layer of the soil is going to be dryish. Yeah. You dig down, it's going to be wetter. Wet. Um, do you think, sorry, I'm going to cut you off yeah. real quick. Do you think there's like a expiry um, date for the, I don't know, obviously expiry date isn't the right word, but do you think there's maybe like an amount, an X amount of nutrition in the soil and then over a period of time, this all gets consumed by the ice pods and now you have to refresh the soil or is this, does that make sense to you? The concept makes sense. I have never seen it. Okay. My dairy cow bin, which is a giant bin, has been going so strong for so many years. Like the soil to me looks like isopod poop. Okay. I, if anything, I, like maybe it would run out of calcium or something like that, but I'm supplementing anything, everything. Right, yeah. It's basically compost in there. Right. Like I, it'd be very easy to take that out and like put it into plants or something like that, although yeah. it would be filled with dairy cows. Yeah. Um, so people talk about like the soil either like maybe becoming toxic, maybe. Um, I haven't found that yet. Mm -hmm. um, and I am observant for it. But I have not had any of my soil go bad. What can happen over time with a lot of things is that the soil will compact. Right. So you want to be careful with that. But a lot of isopods are aerating the soil. Mm -hmm. So they're digging down, creating little holes. Yeah. yeah. So hopefully that balances out. Um, but as of this moment, I have not seen sort of an isopod enclosure crash, and I still call any crash, because the soil has either run out of nutrients or become toxic. Okay. My experience, I don't know. I haven't read, like, I've kind of heard people say that can happen, but I've always, there's always a, mil a lot of things that can happen. A lot of factors too that could have yeah. caused that one thing to happen that yeah. they probably couldn't pinpoint exactly what it was mm -hmm. awesome okay so you said you mix a bunch of different things yeah. could you break down what some of those things are well like a lot like i bought today uh yeah. coconut fiber and coconut husk like okay. i know those are basic but i like them yeah like i i like the color i like the smell yeah i, I like them i think i actually like the smell of them too yeah, yeah. and they serve it's a coconut like mm -hmm. it's nice like i <laughs> see if you used to laugh at me because i would put all of my plants into coconut and yeah. then i realized from now that that's not what you put house plants in right but it's it's good and so so the coconut fiber is kind of the base um the, and then the fiber the, the like husk like big bigger pieces of coconut it chunks it up so that it's more airy right and then they can get under it and stuff like that yeah so i'd say that's the base um we've started using a bit of like special potting soil that Sophia like found that isopod people use it's got a fish on the front okay so maybe have nutrients apparently dip, like a uh, cubaris really like it we've added a little bit to it um soil i have found will naturally often come with uh like fungus gnats eggs. yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't really care about fungus stuff that much, but it's kind of annoying. Yeah, it's very annoying. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> Very, very annoying. I had a little bit of that. Um, and then I start adding a little bit of extras. Okay, nice. So at the, at the plant store, I bought calcium powder. Okay. But I think you could probably use like rapashi calcium. Okay. Mix a little bit of that in. Um, crush up a little bit of leaves. Put some of that in. Yeah. Uh, a little bit of charcoal. I don't like. I think like, and some of these things I don't really even understand what they do so much. But it chunks up the soil a little bit more. Charcoal will they, take out nutrients a little bit. Yeah, I think they probably chew on it and eat it up a little bit. No. Yeah, maybe charcoal. Yeah. Maybe. And then do you it do like wood. you you said you mix in leaf litter into the substrate. Do you also on top of that do like a oh yeah inch or two or on top of the substrate as well? Yeah. Yeah, leaves are important. Yeah, so once you got that nice soil mix, and that's pretty much most, and, and then if it needs to be drier, maybe use a bit of an arid mix, like a, a more sandy type of thing. But yeah. yeah, so then you put all that nice stuff in, you put your certain amount of moss onto your wet side. Okay. Some enclosures I'll have like a quarter, some of it I'll have half. Yeah. With the cubaris or like I will mix sphagnum moss into the soil so that there are chunks of sphagnum moss in the soil. Okay. Maybe that's a bad idea, but I have been doing it and it seems fine. 
And then you put your delicious layer of leaves on top. Delicious. <laughs> oh, I, I, leaves are awesome. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Leaves are just a good thing. So leaves, like, um, leaves. There, there's some good leaves, and are there bad leaves? I don't know. Like, I. <laughs> so you want to go with hardwood leaves. Okay. So hardwood leaves are leaves. Yeah. Whereas like softwood is like pine and cedar and that type of stuff. Right, okay. You don't want to be using like needles. Um, in my leaf collecting, yeah. I will like, not intentionally, but there will be pine needles mixed into it and I have found them in some of my enclosures. I don't think it's a major problem, but yeah, you want to be going with big hardwood leaves. Oak is, I would say, the big one. Mm -hmm. Oak is nice, beautiful leaf. It is is a very solid, thick leaf that doesn't break down very fast. You're collecting your leaves outside. Yeah, so we'll, we'll I'll definitely go into that. Yeah. But, you, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, the oak leaves, like leaves, ho have two purposes, or maybe they hold even more. But they eat them. That's why you don't necessarily need to worry about like, oh, they've run out of food because they're going to be eating the leaves. leaves. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um. So they're food, but they're also the place for isopods to chill under. Mm -hmm. And leaves like just like you find in the wild like you screw screw around some leaves you don't find animal like cool little bugs in it and sometimes salamanders like lots of things live in leaves i um, can't wait for herping season yeah <laughs> yeah no that's that's gonna be good um no I, i'm a little bit excited for that too but uh yeah so oak is one that's not gonna be a break breakdown so i think like yeah it holds nutrition but it's primarily going to be your like sort of stable base where they're gonna like live under it maple Birch, these are other good leaves. Then from the store, magnolia leaves. Like that's good stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Magnolia is good. They're expen more expensive than going outside and collecting leaves. But For sure, they're expensive. And, and then, they're usually like six leaves in a pack. Yeah, yeah <laughs> that's pretty ridiculous. And then like there's like the cones, like little cones and and magnolia cones. I think they're called. Like they're cool. Um, but like as always, the same with the shrimp mulberry 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 is good i i want a mulberry tree yeah and, uh, so once in a while we'll throw in a couple mulberry leaves but primarily i'm using the things that i've collected outside which are oak maple and birch awesome do you sterilize them yeah so so for a while i was buying things at a store yeah. and i would recommend that to people especially starting up you don't have a lot of enclosures Buy a six dollar bag of leaves that'll last you a year. Like, uh, I don't know about a year, but yeah, with one, with one isopod bin. Oh, with one isopod bin, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. I am far past that point. Absolutely. So we, I'm gonna be careful what I say because I honestly don't know how legal some of these things are. I think so, you could like fall in leaf litter. Okay, yeah, I depends so. where, but. Yeah. Let's just say I research where to get them legally. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I go to this legal location. <laughs> and uh, like Sophia and I went, it would, went and like she's different methods. Like Sophia doesn't have as many enclosures. So, so she'll be going like, oh, this is a perfect nice leaf. Like so nice. And, like her collection of leaves is just like beautiful. And then me, like I'm on the ground with a garbage bag. Like just shoving to get in. And like yeah. I'm like looking around all sketchy. Like are <laughs> people watching me? And like I just like take garbage bags. That's and, what I do as well. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so go to somewhere. I go far out of the city. Do you go? Sorry, I keep like interrupting here. But do you go at a specific time? Do you prefer when the ground is wet and the leaves are wet? Or do you prefer when everything is dry and like crusty almost? I think ideally, Greg was saying something important. I can't remember. But I think you, you want to be going like somewhere in the middle. Like I think what Greg was saying is if you go in the wet season, there's less pets, pests to deal with. If I remember correctly, I could be wrong about this, but I think he was saying like, like when I, you're going in the snow, everything's... Yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't know. Like, I, I don't think you want to be collecting them in the spring. Like, I'm not sure, okay. but that's not when I collect. Okay. Like, and maybe I need to look up. I feel like, like fall this. is probably the best time. Yeah. So fall is the best time. And like, if spring, like, cause I, I am right now, I didn't get enough leaves. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I got some, like two, garbage bags and one little garbage bag and i was like this is gonna last me i'm burning through leaves like crazy really okay. so i am now like entering leaf rationing mode okay and like some of my, like my dairy cows 
they could consume like a handful of leaves like overnight in a week yeah oh overnight okay i was gonna say my mine my, like yeah so like, like yeah. some of the isopods they're getting very little leaves but like mo the other ones that are really like i'm trying to get breeding and like i'm using a lot because but uh yeah so i go in the fall if that's you can get it in the spring i'm down but the leaves need to have fallen off the tree, I think. I don't Yeah, no, no, they do. Yes, leaves. no, absolutely. That's true. Yes, 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 yes. So I collect the leaves. People will say different things. People will say they're good to go right away. People will say, so if you put them in right away, there's a chance that little buggies or I don't know, diseases, but that's harder to quantify. From experience, I think the chances are very high. Of what? of not diseases, of bugs. Yeah. Um, I've had it happen in several enclosures here For and sure. I've started to I sterilize everything. Yeah. yeah, so bugs, bugs, no doubt. Whether the bugs are bad or not. Yeah, okay, who knows, yeah, that's true. Yeah. But yeah, no doubt. And like, I, so I collected those, even in the fall, like I had those bags of leaves. I just left them open and like, I would just, tons of stuff was crawling out of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm um, probably into it maybe <laughs> like i left them in my garage okay. with the garage door open yeah and uh, yeah like they probably st like i would just i was like seeing spiders come out and stuff like yeah, that yeah for sure. so yeah like i i too like i'm not putting them directly into anything okay so how do you sterilize them people so uh, people will say you can freeze them that doesn't make as much sense because these things survive they're the freezing outside yeah. yeah so a lot of these animals are designed to live through freezing temperatures they've got like like uh antifreeze in their blood pretty much um maybe not the bugs i know that some frogs do and stuff yeah but um they have ways of surviving and maybe their eggs are super strong i think that's what it is yeah they almost like try offs where they lay the eggs die off and then the yeah. eggs hatch and fall so here. other people boil them that will kill things but then you're also that water is going to be brown Mm -hmm. And it's the same as, like, if you're boiling an almond leaf for an aquarium, you're taking the good stuff out of the You're taking the tannins the out, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I don't boil them. What I do is I put them in a layer, ideally a one leaf layer, but I put them in a pile, basically. You put them in an oven. Yeah, everyone be careful. Be careful. Like, I have never set a fire, but I don't want to be encouraging someone to yeah. burn down their house. So, what ooh. temperature do you put at? 200 degrees okay so, so i will go i will tell you you're probably good to, i i go to 30, 240 yeah. 235 240 so you need to cook yeah. them low yeah how long do you cook them for i usually do about an hour to two hours okay yeah same um i honestly i i, I usually put them in there and forget about them so it's usually more like three four and i will also say i don't know if you agree with me on this but the smell that comes out is incredible. I like the smell. The, Sometimes my kitchen starts smelling amazing. Yeah, I know. I, I agree. I, I do like the smell. In the past, it has triggered my allergies a little bit. Yeah, that makes and sense. That yeah. might be just because there's other stuff on the leaf. Yeah, but no, the smell of like a nice cooking leaf. Like, so good. That's a good. That's a good yeah. smell. So that that's that's uh, yeah, it's good. That's the way we both do it. Mm -hmm. And then you got a nice pile of dried, like little bit crispy leaves. Uh, so you put them in, two hundred. You do 240, couple hours, take them out, put them somewhere. They're going to be cri pretty crispy, so you don't want to crunch them up too much. Um, but uh, that is the way to get a good amount of leaves and put them, use them safely, get sourcing them from a non-pesticide area, and then not putting poison or er, uh, bugs into your tank. Awesome. Um, so yeah, leaves, these are important, all those delicious leaves you put them on top of your substrate you are replacing them as they're getting eaten mix them into your soil maybe a little bit um but leaves are something you should really be adding and yeah it's it kind of classes up the joint like, awesome. <laughs> it makes it look good i do agree though even in even in vivariums yeah. whatever when you it, it looking at it fi fully scaped with no leaf litter and then looking at the same tank two minutes later fully scaped with leaf litter makes a huge difference in natural yeah, yeah yeah no it's it really it's ties good. it all together yeah, yeah absolutely definitely. yeah cool so any other it. substrate tips or how to build the actual setup tips or do we or do we want to jump on to diet so a couple last things yes of the, of the extras yes. so after you put the leaves then you want to keep going sorry after you put the leaves, 
then you want to be putting the hides. So there should be a couple pieces of wood that they can get under. Um, the, they might be fine with just leaves, but I use a lot of cork. I like cork. Um, it comes in nice flat pieces that you can put, like the isopods can get under. Um, I, I've heard a lot of people and a lot of, I'd say the more expert people use rotting pieces of wood. I have not gotten into that yet because I am not familiar with it and there might be ways it could go wrong maybe, but um, I use flat and sort of a little bit curvy pieces of hide, of cork as a hide, just like kind of my basic, like my, my great skills with ball pythons. I've got one on the wet side, one on the dry side, <laughs> okay. and then I maybe have one that is Covers in the middle yeah, that yeah, goes yeah. between. The other concept that I've been hearing a little bit more about is having it, and maybe some isopods probably prefer this more than others, but having it so that the hide is not pressed up against the ground. Sorry, so it's kind flat. of like, no, you're okay. Yeah. Kind of like curved so you, they can get into it yes. under it. Yeah, yeah. So you could be leaning the cork on another piece of cork. Um, any any type of method, you could be leaning it on another ornament, anything like that, I think is a good idea. Uh, I don't entirely understand it, but I've been starting to do it. And especially for the species that like it a bit drier, like uh, those, those wonderful big isopods I'm talking about, uh, I think giving them a hide that is not flat against the ground is a good idea. Okay, let me ask you this. So I heard once that some, some I don't know, I can't remember where I heard this, but that they'll only breed, and this kind of sounds a little bit like they only grow to the size of their enclosure, but it's not that. They only breed to the amount of surface area that they have in the enclosure. So... I think that there are reasons why that might be true. Um, there are... So like not enough hides or not enough whatever, and if you include more hides, then they have more areas to start kind of going after they breed or whatever. Yeah, I think it's less about them actually like breeding and more like, or like sort of meeting each other and more like the female will release the babies too early. I've heard of that. Okay. And we'll talk about behavior more later, but some of the big isopods are territorial. Okay. So they will kill each other. Like the, the males will fight. Okay, interesting. Um, so yeah, I think having a good amount of hides is important. Um, you may find you provide them with a bunch of hides and they're all under one. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. But I have definitely seen with my big Spanish isopods that you'll have sort of little territories and like there will be one group under one pile and one one group under one hide one group under another hide yeah um so i've sort of noticed that as well and it always seems to be not that i can really tell the difference between my eyes about but it always seems to be the same group that are under the same so. cork bark and they kind of they establish so. that as their territory yeah and yeah like um i got uh bolivari which is another big one for um for for christmas like i it was a nice little present okay and um when i got them we it, we put them into a big enclosure they were all under one house okay so they were all under one hide all sort of really congregated closely together interesting then there was a bunch of babies that showed up and they all spaced out huh so i think when the babies happened the parents were becoming more territorial. Yeah. So they pushed the rest out. That makes sense. Because uh, there's like particular isopods that are like sort of hovering around the babies. Mm -hmm. And then the rest are in the different hides. I think giving them a little bit more hides than they need is probably a good thing to do. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then other than that, um, you're going to want to be putting like calcium sources into the tank. So one thing that I've, a clever little thing I've been doing is like I take a cuddle bone, I put like a piece on the dry side and then on the wet side, I take the moss up and put the moss on top of the cuddle bone. Mm. So it's got like a little cave. Underneath. Yeah. yeah that makes sense. And so they're going to be munching on the, the cuddle bone. Uh, some people use crushed eggshells. I haven't started doing that, although it might be a cool idea. Uh, I've tried it and they seem to not go for it. Yeah, like, I don't, like, these are not something they're going to, like, devour. Yeah. But if they're eating a little bit once in a while, maybe. Yeah. Um, and then the other one that 
some people use but less people because maybe it's harder to source is limestone of some kind yeah and so i have lots of it because coral like the the live rock that you use for a reef tank is like limestone. limestone yeah it's a type of limestone and so i got lots of it and i've been giving it out to all all the homies um and you see that they use it and they, they you find them on it and eating it or is it hard to tell i do find them on it yeah the dairy cows will eat away at the rock wow like i i've seen rocks like go away wow uh yeah they're a special <laughs> brunch yeah their cows are definitely but, a special uh, brunch for sure i do think that it is a good idea so what i do I, I don't know how many of you guys are reef people but like i take the aquarium rock and i soak it over and over again in uh water to get all the salt like fresh water yeah yeah fresh water uh and then i take it into my garage and i put it onto a piece of cardboard and i put like a piece of cardboard on top of it trying to encircle it and i beat it up with a hammer yeah, yeah, yeah. and then it f fragments into a lot of pieces limestone is not the hardest rock so yeah. it's pretty easy to break up right and then i put little pieces into my enclosures yeah and i try to i don't know yeah like some of these things might not be important but i try to put like a little bit of everything on both sides because there's people that talk about that isopods some of them and especially babies don't want to go too far right like often um so i try to put them on both sides just in case and um yeah the the last thing that i would add to every enclosure are springtails yeah you do put springtails over your icebox every single one okay um springtails most of you probably know what they are, but they're a tiny little bug and they are, to my understanding, fungus specialists. They're very, very good cleaners. Um, and when they're happy, they will breed fairly well and they will, they'll do a couple things. So they'll keep mold and extra food down, of course. Yeah. Um, the other thing is that they will outcompete our unwanted guests. Yes. Uh, like they will typically outcompete flies and mites, even like the like rain mites, not predatory mites, but yeah, uh, they will outcompete the less desirable. <laughs> oh, we gotta watch that that word. Uh, they will outcompete other um, bugs, little bugs, um, that will cause potential problems for maybe just annoying fatty. Yes, or, yes. Uh, very much annoying fatty. Yes, they. I don't know. Like they may even outcompete things that are bad for isopods. I've never dealt with bugs that are bad with isopods, but I know that springtails are good. And it's another one that like, like like I said about the, the dwarf white isopods, like once you get a colony of springtails going, they're pretty good. Yeah. You with your dart frogs, you've managed to yeah. really yes. hard breed springtails. Yeah, I had, well, not anymore. I'm not really doing much with dart frogs, but I had a whole, those Ikea CD shelves just yeah. Like I had probably 50 cultures okay, at one so point. So you had yeah. a lot of cultures. So yeah. I've never been able to really breed them en masse in their own enclosure. I've tried, but food, tons of food. They eat a lot. Yeah. Um, I what give what did you feed them? Yeah. So the, first I was doing uh, powdered yeast, Yeah. but you have to be careful with the powdered yeast because if you overfeed, then it molds, then because they're so sealed, I guess the air quality gets bad. So Greg talks about that you will carbon dioxide poison. That's what it is. Yeah. yeah. So, so so you have to be careful with the yeast. Um, shout out uh, Mike and Bree, the Jungle Vault. Um, they got they got springtail food. I should probably yeah I should probably just grab it quick here right here. Yeah. So so I don't know what's in it. I have no idea. Um, but they call it spring snacks. <laughs> there you go. Um, it doesn't mold, man. Okay. So like you can you can overfeed, and it never molds. I don't know what's in it. I but don't know if it's just the mold that would be causing carbon dioxide, but maybe. I oh, I'm not sure, but um. You know, like, I I'd yeah. love to try it out. I've, uh, I've seen that at Greg's house. I've yeah. I'm down for products. I actually, I actually have two of them. Grab one. Mm, uh, okay. Try it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. So and then the other thing is I've I tried to do it on three different substrates. 
So charcoal, which is like the most common one for springtails. And then uh, Greg actually mixed up a calcium clay. So we did it on that. That went really well too. And then, uh, sorry, uh, shout out to Understory Enterprises. Um, he sells them on like this dried, so not dried, like baked soil. Mm. It's a very thin layer of soil, but they go crazy on that. Mm. But it's also very much where they boom and then you use them, which obviously is most springtail cultures, but specifically on that um, kind of dirt cake or whatever it's called, um, they boom, you use them, and it seems like it's you end up using more than you need to use. And then the second boom takes time to come back again. Okay. Um, but yeah, for just for breathing springtails, um, it's it's consistency. It's co constantly feeding them, staying on top of them, on top of them, spraying them, keeping them humid, and then not having other springtail species around, um, because it's very similar to dwarf whites. Easier than dwarf whites, they don't climb. They just like if you open a springtail enclosure, odds are 10, 15 of them are coming out just from the pressure of you opening it. Right, so springtail jump. Right, well, like yeah, that's that why too. they call them springtail. Right, well, that too, and yeah. So I had I was working with three different species, and three three different species, and then it became one because one of them just kept getting into all the other enclosures and now competing each other, ah. and then, so that became the most prominent one, which is which was the the most common one, Columbula, Formosa, F something, Formosa, something like that. that yeah. the, so that's the the more tropical one, right? Like quote unquote, the one that likes the humidity more. That's what they say. Okay, uh, yeah. So yeah, I see, because I think mine are predominantly the other. Arid ones, Cinella or whatever? Not arid, but yeah. Yeah, like or, or the, the, what they were being saying is can handle like, drier temperatures. I don't think they jump as much, mm -hmm. and they're, I think they're a bit bigger. Bigger, yes, correct. So The ones that at Critter Jungle or by Big Bites are sold as the pink container, right? I think so. Yeah, those are the Cinellas or whatever, yeah. Okay, yeah, and then, yeah, because, and then the other thing is keeping them on soil, which you've had mixed results with. Yeah. Where Only it's... with the orange springtails I've yeah. had the mixed results with. Because yeah. I, I have never had a reason to breed springtails en masse. Mm -hmm. I've only ever used them as cleanup crew where mm -hmm. you're using them as feeders. As feeders for baby frogs, yeah. So I've never had to mass produce them because I can just take my springtails from one culture and move it into move the it. next one. Yeah. Um, but I really like those orange springtails. I They're finally beautiful. got my hands on some. Yeah. And I am keeping them on soil, and I haven't seen a huge boom yet. I've only had them for since the last reptile, I suppose, so two months. Two months, or, a month and a half. Yeah, yeah. but well, they're, yeah, they're still doing one. Well. Like I showed you, like because yeah. I've been I've been doing more like squash. Like okay. I do use the yeast, yeah, but I really like squash these days. Okay, and uh, I find that they eat it. Do you give that to your ice pods as well? Yes. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, so just to comment on the orange springtails thing, uh, uh, what I, my experience was with them was I was gifted a uh, small culture on charcoal mm -hmm. and they would do re they were doing really well. I had them for over a year. Anything, any food I put in there, they ate. But it seemed to me, even after a year, which with springtails, like within two or three weeks, you should see like a boom or a difference in the culture. A year later, it felt like the original group was still there and there wasn't really much. Like I would see babies, but I wouldn't see like a boom boom. And then somebody, I don't know who it was, I can't remember, but somebody mentioned uh, they do better on soil, not on charcoal, move them over. And I moved them over on soil and they're doing worse now. Okay. So that's just my experience with them. But yeah. it could have also been, I shocked them by moving them onto soil so suddenly or... Yeah, no, yeah. And there's like so many different factors. Yeah. Because I think like Nate was saying like he moved his onto soil and now he's got tons of... Them. Maybe that's what it was that told me, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we all have different results. Right, absolutely. Um... I don't know, um, but like could even be an external factor that's affecting not the soil or the charcoal. That's, and it's just, yeah, yeah that's, absolutely. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Like it, I imagine like temperature, like all, all these things. Like so, spreading springtails. Are you keeping them warm? Or are you keeping them cool? I'm keeping them room temperature. Okay. Yeah. So I wonder if too cold is bad. I wonder yeah. if heating them up will speed them up. Speed them up. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. Um, I would assume it would. Okay. I would assume it would. Do you. I, I like I've seen your your room. You keep your eyes bloods at room temperature as well, right? Yeah, yeah you don't have any heat. But on my them. my room is warmer because it's filled with here living too. things. Here too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like it's usually sitting around twenty four in here. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so I it's hard. I don't know. I don't know. More yeah. research is needed. Definitely, definitely. And uh, but yeah, I I like it that like not only 
Like I, I like I like the little bugs and like because you you told me recently you've got a blue type of springtail. Yeah, well, yeah. Let me give you a culture on your way out. Yeah, th those naturally appeared in one of my tanks. And I sent cool. some pictures to some people and they were like, "That's definitely like a a blue springtail." Um, and yeah, I'm trying the, to culture them, but I don't the know how. The red one's out there. Yeah, yeah. The, the red ones recently started like showing up in the Canadian market. So I'm down to collect them all. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Yeah. Springtails are cool, but I, I yeah, I. I have had a lot of luck breeding um, isopods, and like when someone's like, "Oh, do you have a culture of springtails?" I hope I, I try to give them some. Yeah. Um, but I've never, I could never like feed a bunch of dart frogs my springtails. Right. Okay. Um, it's multiple cultures. That's what it is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just so, so how many cultures did you start with? Like how many of those deli cups of ice of springtails? Well, I immediately move them out of the deli cups. Yeah. Yeah, so I I I, uh, I would buy like say two of those deli cups and then put get it like a, a like not a shoebox size tub but like something slightly smaller, mm -hmm. and I would put a layer of charcoal in there and then dump both both cultures in there into one bin. It probably yeah. I so would say that. Had, but are you saying that within your ten bins you had bought twenty cultures by spring cups? Probably yeah. Wow. Probably yeah. Okay, because yeah. yeah, I've never been like that. I've, yeah, yeah, I've had one of the red ones and one of the big oh ones. no no yeah no i definitely bought at least 20 cultures and there would still be times where because i was like when i was doing it like heavy there were times when i had like 400 froglets yeah so i'd be like i'd have to go buy another culture and then the culture i'd buy wouldn't be yeah. as advanced enough to feed from so it was like it, i would just hoard in cultures honestly fruit flies were the same thing for me too like i would c create my own cultures but it's like it was so hard to stay on a schedule, which is mainly why I'm not a dark frog, by the way, it was fruit flies drove me crazy. But um, then with my one culture of fruit flies, yeah. they are also driving me crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, other than the fact that they're everywhere and they manage to get out so easily, it's it's staying consistent with when you create the new culture. And then it would be like, oh no, my cultures that I created aren't ready and the ones that created jungle aren't ready. And like now I'm stressing, now I have to feed something else now. So like, yeah, fruit flies were a stress for sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, and to like, like say the worms for the aquarium, like my, uh, micro worms. Micro worms, like, yeah, yeah. When I need them to slow down, I will cool them down. Mm -hmm. When I need them to speed up, I'll put them on my fridge so that they get the, the heat. heat. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I was told from you guys that if you're heating up fruit flies, they start flying. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. That's an interesting little. Well, so it depends on if you have the melan melan melanogasters or the high di. Okay. Because the melanogasters don't have wings. Is that the green one or the yellow one? The yellow one. <laughs> the, the yellow so ones don't the have small one. Yes. Okay. So they don't have wings, so they won't start flying. But the high di, they're not wingless. They're just flightless. Mm -hmm. And if you heat them up too much, they somehow start flying. Again. Yeah, it's no, crazy. Someone told me it messes with their genetics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're yeah. genetically modified. Yeah. Well, they are, they're all wings. genetically modified. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, interesting. So you've set up the bin. You've put the substrate in. You've put the leaf litter in. You have your hides. What is our next step for you? So as a sort of uh, pet store employee in me, <laughs> I Love that. say you should ideally look up the isopod you are buying before you buy it. Before you jump into that, yeah. in terms of isopod you are buying for cleanup crew in a vivarium or isopod you're buying if you're looking to put them in the setup you just mentioned, the bin, and you kind of want to be I'd quote unquote both. breeding isopod. Like, both. Okay, yeah, awesome. Like, I'd say both. Like, you, you're not going to be wanting to put like a desert isopod, like not a desert, but like an arid isopod into your mountain horde dragon tanks. For sure. You're not going to be wanting to put like, I don't know, something that needs it super wet like a, say dairy cows into your bearded dragon tank so both ways i would recommend do what i say not what i do yeah. uh, don't impulse buy people yeah, don't, <laughs> never do that we never do that uh yeah don't go to the expo and be like i don't know what i'm gonna get but i'm gonna walk away with hundreds of dollars of isopods but no but you, you say you do that but at the same time we spoke a day before the show and you had a list of the isopods you wanted right like, yeah but i was ready to buy whatever <laughs> but i was also willing to do the research and find out what they need it was after i bought them yeah yeah because yeah. i was like whatever i'm gonna <laughs> buy i'm gonna do the research and make sure to provide it for them as quickly as i can right um but uh yeah so I would say, no matter what species of, of anything you are getting, do some reading on them. Do a bit of research. 
Now, is there care guides? Sorry, I keep interrupting you, but is there care guides for individual species out there? I have found them for almost everyone. Okay, cool. Some of them are a little bit harder to find. Okay, cool. Um, but YouTube, good thing. Um, lots of isopod sellers online that will give you a care guide. Mm -hmm. And especially as you're deep diving into it, like some of the isopods when I've been bored, say like at school, uh, I've been just like researching and like going deeper. Cause like as much as those little tidbits of like advanced knowledge I can grab, yeah. like, I eat that up. Right, no, absolutely. So do some research. And also if any of Theo's students are listening, he never gets bored at school. He was just saying that. He's yeah. actually always okay. entertained by your presence. Yes, <laughs> so entertaining. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'm just constantly entertained. Uh, I'm not really joking. Uh, entertained to the point of like, I don't have hair to lose anymore. <laughs> I would be losing more hair. Um, your beard hair is gonna start falling out yeah. soon. Yeah. Uh, so do a bit of research. The other thing that is a good idea is if you can, talk to the person that has bred them about how they have kept them mm -hmm. because you mentioned this sort of like about springtails like you can shock them like if the, some of my isopods i have kept more moist in the past than is recommended online so i would if i can talk to the person that is selling them and try to get an idea of what they are being kept in mm -hmm. if you're going to a store that has a bunch of deli cups, that's a bit more tricky. But if you can figure out, if you can find out uh, what they are used to and either keep it that way or slowly adjust them, I would say that that is a good recommendation. Because uh, there are some isopods that can handle a range, mm -hmm. like our Priscillianoids or whatever that one, uh, Lavis. Uh, I'd say even the Dwarf Whites. Yeah, yeah, I, I haven't tested them in more drier conditions. I, you have? I have. Yeah. Okay. yeah, well, as dry as, like, I don't want to say dry, dry, but, like, that, um, my first uh, Crested Gecko um, build, I shouldn't say my first, like, the first build that has lasted till today, mm -hmm. that's still, it's been, like, it's actually James, um, I am Nomad, um, on Instagram, shout out, set it up four or five years ago now, and it's still sitting right there, but because it's so old, it's harder to keep the soil moist. It's harder to kind of, so right. like, yeah, so it definitely needs a redo, um, but the dwarf whites are thriving in there. Okay. Thriving, yeah. Yeah, so a lot of animals are adaptable. Yeah. But you wanna go slow with that adaptability. For sure. Uh, some may pre prefer more heat than others. Like for me, I'm keeping my nice like Spanish isopods on a higher level of the rack. Mm -hmm. And then my Cubaris I'm putting on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Some of them are gonna be like more in caves where others are in like a field in Spain. Um, and then you're gonna, of course, the humidity, you're gonna really wanna find out how much moisture that particular species is going to need. Um, so you're keeping Spanish isopods, are you keeping any Arab isopods? I don't know if they exist. <laughs> I, I would buy them. The one that I'm after now, yeah. like the most, is called the Greek Shield isopod. The Greek Shield. Yeah, okay. it's Werneri. It's the one that I told you to look out for. Oh, Werneri. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. They are cool. They are big and they are flat. Okay. And that is a Greek isopod. So I like. I don't know. Feels close to home. <laughs> yeah, I just like them. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't know. Are there isopods in? There's definitely isopods in the Middle East. I think isopods exist everywhere. I, I used to, I remember seeing them growing up, uh, oh. but I don't know. I wouldn't know what species they are or if they're actually any value or if they're just okay. like the common yeah. isopod that you see everywhere. Yeah, yeah I was just so, making a joke. <laughs> no, no, I, I hear you. Like yeah. I've, I've collected some very plain isopods before. And, yeah. And uh, like I got this one type isopod and the dude was like, you will never see them. Like they will be in the substrate and you will never see them. I'd be like, I, I'll pay 20 bucks for that. Yeah. <laughs> have an enclosure that's empty. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, I, so, so, so research it. I'm, yeah, I'm looking up, uh, oh, you mean research your eyes before you're doing them? Yeah. yeah. I'm looking up the Porcilio Werner Eye. Yeah, I have seen those before. They're, you have? Uh, not in person. Like I've seen pictures of them. Yeah, They're beautiful. They yeah, are yeah. Nice. You're like you have, you have and you haven't told me. <laughs> no, I've, I've told everybody to keep their eye open for it. Yeah. yeah and yeah. like, I am willing to pay more than they are probably worth, even though I don't know what they're worth, but I am willing to pay a lot for them. Okay. Um, but if you have them, sell them to me for cheap. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah. So 
Cool. So now you've picked your isopods. So you, you've picked your isopod, or at least like you are willing to do the research. So you go to, the multiple ways of getting isopods. You get them from a friend or a local person. You can talk to them about it. Uh, you go to a store. You can at least see. Sometimes you're getting them shipped in. I very rarely, like I've not dealt with shipping very much. You've dealt with shipping before. Um, I have received things. I've never shipped anything myself. Um, I have noticed that a lot of the time, adult, at least isopods, don't ship as well as little ones. Mm. So there, when we got the Bolivari, uh, there were some big ones that passed away, but some of them were pregnant. Mm. So it balances out. And so that's where, like, one time, like, Expanses, I think, is my favorite. Like okay. If I were to pick one, other than the Werner Eye, which I don't have, yeah. I love Expanses. The first time I got Expanses, I when I when I was moving them, one was biting me. That's hilarious. <laughs> and I was like, oh, it's biting me. <laughs> like, How cute! I don't like it when things bite me. Typically, but it like you don't typically get bitten by ice spots. So like this sort of like really neutral creature was like expressing itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't know if it was trying to eat me or if it was mad. <laughs> but uh, it's a it's a cool one. But yeah, so when I was getting expanses, well, I saw it and I was like, oh, I need that. Yeah. I looked at the culture. I think it was like a culture of eight. And four of the adults were dead. Wow. At well, the, wherever you were buying them at? At wherever I was buying them at. Okay. Um, and I was like, okay, that's crappy. But I looked into the bit, the, the deli cup. And there's tons of babies. Tons of babies. Yeah. And Curtis Dungal has learned their little marketing technique now is right. We, I have babies. I have, or like, we have babies. We have babies. And I, I saw We that. say that our lie to each other all the time. Like, it's. Like, if I see that, like, there was one time where, like, the isopods that they were carrying, I had brought them in. Yeah. And <laughs> had, we had babies on the thing, and I was like, should I buy that? <laughs> buy it back for them. babies buy them, yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so if you can find, it, it's going to be, I, I will explain later how to see if an isopod is gravid. So if it's going to have babies, even though it's pretty, it can be difficult. Um, and what are baby ice spots called? Mankai? Mankai. Yeah. Mankies. Mankies. And yeah. yeah, no, I like, yeah, they got a cute name. And uh, yeah, I, lo I like a lot of uh, Reptiliatus' videos on isopods. And uh, he will just like go on about the Mankai. Yeah. And I just, I just love that. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, That's it's funny. so funny. He's a good source for uh, isopod stuff would, as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, maybe he can hook me up with something. Yeah. But, or maybe I can hook him up with something. Yeah. But um, yeah, so if you can find ones with babies, that's a good sign. Um, if you find them with dead isopods in them, that's not great. Tell them that, tell whoever has it that there are dead isopods in that enclosure and tr try to fix that. And probably, usually they have dried out. Yeah. Uh, or maybe they're too wet. Um, and try to get a discount. Yeah. Um, but that is what I look for. Um, when I'm at the expo now, I am looking for particular ones, but I'm also keeping my eye out for just ones that are cool that I don't have. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, do the research. You what know, it's interesting when I was once at, um, buying shrimp and I used to, I don't know if you remember this, but I used to go pick out all the gravid females course, or the buried females. We all do that. Yeah, but there was one, one time where you were like, I like you were recommending that taking home the babies you have a higher survival rate. Maybe this was one with one specific type of shrimp. Maybe this was with like the crystals or something. But you said that taking home the babies, they're more likely to acclimate to your water and to your parameters than to the buried females. That is, so, well, I would always say if you find a buried animal and you, you like that animal. Take it, yeah, for yeah, sure. Take yeah, it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Like, unfortunately, when you are moving one around, yeah, they can release their eggs early. And that right. happens with, both shrimp and isopods okay and that's not good yeah so when you are taking any animal home be careful yeah like, don't shake them around remember one time when we were driving back from montreal, montreal. <laughs> and we hit that bump and we had so many things in the back and we're like and they're dead and everything's gone but yeah. they were fine <laughs> everything made it home actually that but, day yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> try your best to be careful um because you're 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 this giant carrying home yeah. this tiny little creature but isopods don't have eggs right they have like live babies like that she carries in a sack. Okay. Um, I don't think they're eggs. I okay. think it's like 
they probably are eggs at one point that develop. I should have researched this more because like the shrimp, they're carrying eggs. Yeah, I guess so. They're carrying eggs. But like then crayfish, I think they're carrying eggs. Right. That's, and they go the into egg, living go, animals. Yeah, you're right. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's almost like they're carrying the embryo that forms into the baby or yeah, the larva so or whatever. Yeah. I, I would have, like, I don't know if the eggs... Like they have to deposit, I, I have not researched on how the actual like physical mechanisms of a mother isopod work, but somehow they get babies on their chest that they are carrying around in a sack and then they release those babies. Okay. Um, so yeah, be careful. Um, sorry, I forget what the question you, or if we had a question. No, I don't think we did that. So, okay. yeah, yeah. so yeah, so, so go for isopods if you can, if you see a culture that you like that has babies, just buy it. Don't even think. Just buy. <laughs> um, Follow Theo's methodology. Yeah. And so like when I am selling isopods, I'm trying my best. Like I, I am both a big consumer and a producer. Right. And I like to make my people that are buying or people that I'm selling to happy. So I'm trying to put adult isopods into the, the thing. Because like there's times where like so like someone will be selling rubber duckies and they will be like only babies. some babies yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't like that i mm -hmm. i just it's all ob it's obviously going to take you longer to reproduce them but I, I don't think that the babies are supposed to be away from their mom okay yeah, yeah i think that makes sense yeah. yeah but uh yeah so if you can find a culture with babies you buy it awesome so you got your culture yes now what's the next step so you're bringing them home yes you bring them home what i try to do is gently remove the animals one by one from the deli cup. You don't just dump it in? I don't just dump it in. Okay, I absolutely just dump it in. <laughs> I've done that in the past, but yeah. I don't do that anymore. Okay. Uh, it's shocking. Yeah. Like, I, so yeah, I try to remove them one by one. Some people will even go so far as like use a paintbrush or something, but like I, I, I won't rinse off my hands just like when I'm interacting with anything. And then I just gently use my hands to coax them onto my hand and into the enclosure. The next choice is whether to add that soil yeah. into the enclosure. Do you? Sophia would say that she likes to add the soil because it's familiar to them. Yeah, and it's I would so say there's probably babies hiding in there. Yeah, so that's the other thing. Yeah. There's babies hiding in there. Yeah. You can look for babies, I'm pretty sure. Like, yeah, I guess like, you could. Unless they're so microscopic at the beginning, but I don't think they are. Yeah. So the risk is you add everything else that's in that. Right. So I've gotten grain mites, I've gotten dwarf whites, yeah. I've gotten gnats from adding that substrate. Do I still add the substrate? You do. Yes, I do. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm willing to accept the risk. If you are a person that likes everything like as sterile, quote unquote, as possible, like just those animals in just that enclosure, only put the animals into the enclosure. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's benefits for both. When I am making a culture for someone, I just put, I put fresh everything and just those animals because I don't want to be putting anything that I have, which I don't have dangerous things, but I do have dwarf whites and some things. I do have springtails. If they don't want those, I don't want to give them to them. Right. Yeah. 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 So, so you put a fresh, fresh substrate and you manually move over the animals. Yeah. And then that being said, um, going, seeing different people selling isopods. There are people that do it very minimally mm -hmm. and there's people that do it what I like. So yeah. when I am creating a deli cup for someone, um, I put the same basic mix that I have. Maybe right. I don't put you, you, charcoal. Almost like a mini, mini enclosure. Yeah, mini enclosure. I, I use a little bit of cuddle bone. I don't put a piece of crushed coral in there, but I do use the same soil mix I would with any other isopod. And then I put moss in there on one side at least. And then I put a leaf on the top. If you are just seeing just a bit of soil, mm -hmm. or I've even seen some people just use Spagnol moss or paper towel. Or paper towel, yeah. Uh, that's less ideal. And I think the time that they can live in that enclosure is lower. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Awesome. So what about feeding? Because this is probably the big question that people have. And I, I guess my bigger question would be, because I, I think most people know that they're like scavengers, the you know, wide range of things, but are there certain species that are like prefer protein heavy, some that are more 
you know, vegetarians, I don't know if I'm using the right wording here, but yeah, is there is there a difference between between what they prefer to eat? Yes. Okay. Um, I wouldn't say I'm, a, I'm an expert on it, and I do try to provide everything to everyone, yeah. but I have definitely heard people say protein-hungry isopod before, and that's also potentially accompanied with people being like, don't put them with your reptiles because they will bite on your reptiles. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. But I have definitely seen, like, say my the giant isopods, you think that they would be monster eaters. They're not. They're eating leaves mostly. Mm -hmm. um, the latest dairy cows will devour everything. Yeah. So fun fact and, and, and you know disclaimers, ethical animal. Well, I don't. I don't even know how to disclaim this properly. But I use my uh, dairy cows as um, they clean the dead animals for like ta for taxidermy. Yeah. Um, so they'll they'll eat flesh straight off a dead an a dead animal. I don't know about a live one, but yeah. Yep. No, they'll, they'll, eat it, they'll clean it up all the way. That is their job. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like, I think there are, they definitely have preferences. And yeah. the other thing is like, I've learned this from shrimp. I've learned this from my greatest enemy, Scuds. <laughs> when a animal has a bunch of babies, they're going to be protein deficient. So depending right. on where they are in their life cycle, right. their diet will probably need to change. Okay. Um, so that's why I like to provide... I like to say a little bit, but a medium amount of everything uh, so that they have excess, so that they're not really competing with each other, so that should there be dwarf whites in the enclosure, the dwarf whites won't be able to eat all the food and then the isopods that I like won't have any. And when you say all the food, how much and how frequently? Yeah, so that's the tricky thing. Yeah. Um, like I said with the shrimp, uh, they're going to you got to like sort of be sensitive to the cultures. So you got to listen to them. You got to see when there is excess food in the terrarium, you feed less. Mm -hmm. When they are eating all of the, like I some of my bigger cultures, I put like a full carrot in because carrot takes a long time to like for them to eat and um, doesn't mold really. Um, if they're devouring a whole carrot, then I'm like, okay, I got to be stepping up the feeding. Yeah. Um, so how much is dependent on the size of the culture and how fast it is growing and how fast it is cleaning with eating everything. Some people will say, a lot of people say, and that's probably wise, that they should be able to eat everything within two or three days and then they have a couple days where they're eating leaves or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I may do a bit more feeding than that. Yeah. Because like I'm, a, I'm on a cycle of like, I feed the isopods about once a week. Okay. Uh, so I, if I see like a pile of food in the tank from last week, I'm like, crap, I got to feed them less. Yeah. But I probably will feed more than your average person. And I have not had too much problem with that. I, I have heard that isopods can become unhealthy okay. from consuming too much food. Too much of a certain type of food or just too much food in general? Maybe both. Okay. Um, that... Maybe. Um, I haven't seen it with my own cultures. I, I feed a lot. Mm -hmm. And I've never seen isopods. Do you think isopods are sentient? <laughs> That's a tricky word, bud. <laughs> Is the planet sentient? <laughs> Maybe. Uh, uh, okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I was just... I was, um, yeah. Sentient? Yeah, I think, I think a lot of things are. But uh, I'm a bit crazy. Um, but uh, yeah, so how much and how often... That's going to be dependent on your culture, but I would say feed at least once a week. And the more important thing really is checking on the moisture level of the wet side. Because there was one time where I lost a culture. I think I mentioned this even on a previous podcast and it, it just, I did not like it. Mm -hmm. So I do not want them to dry out. What I actually do with my bins is I always have the wet side facing me. Okay. So that I can see the moss. Mm -hmm. uh, and if I see that moss getting dry, I'm like, okay, I got to top you up no matter when it is. That's very interesting. I used to keep the wet side away from me because, and this may, this may make no sense, but there was a wall behind it. Yep. So I would think there's less aeration and that maybe it dries out. That makes like, yeah. sense. Like I, that's what I used to do too. Yeah. But I still prioritize. See, like so people get mad, people get mad at me. Because I am 
I might keep some things a little bit wetter than they should. Right. It's because I've seen something dry out and I never ever want that to happen again. Right. So I do keep an eye on the soil on the dry side. And if I have overwatered it and I can feel wetness on the half that is supposed to be dry, I will put it, uh, I don't, I've never seen them climb out, but I will put it into a big Rubbermaid and with the lid off so that mm. I can dry it out a little bit. Okay. But, um, yeah, checking on the water is more important in my opinion than checking on whether they have food, food or not. Or not. Okay. The other thing is like, as long as you're keeping leaves in the enclosure, they have something to eat. They always have something to eat. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So, okay, but so what types of food are you feeding? Like I used to do, and this is like very basic, like, like two or three options. I used to do like froze, freeze dried minnows, fish food, or um, like spirulina or some other type of like green yeah. per se. Um, but I feel like I wasn't giving them enough variety and there's probably, yeah. So what do, what do you feed them? What kind of things? Well, Reptiliatus has given, I don't know if I should keep name dropping him. No, no, um, absolutely. Go ahead, shout out Dion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's given me multiple ideas. Yeah. Because uh, before I was just using mostly my kitchen scraps of vegetables yeah, and yeah, stuff yeah. like that. Um, but I do have fish, so I would give them a bit of fish food too. But so the, I, I use a lot of um, vegetables. I, because my diet has a lot of vegetables. Uh, I use a lot of mushrooms, which are fungi, but mushrooms. I use a lot of sweet mushrooms. potato and squash now. Okay. Uh, I find that they love that. Yeah. And I use a lot of carrot. I, I learned that from Reed actually. Okay. Um, that carrot lasts a long time and doesn't mold. Yeah. The other thing, cool thing about the carrots that I'm finding now is that I chop off the end, so like the part where the leaf would grow out, and I yeah. put it face down in the moist side, and it grows roots and then grows a little plant on the top. And do they eat? I'm always getting pissed off at them because they're eating their house plant. Are they? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> their yes, house plant. They will still eat it. And it's kind of cool seeing like them slowly eating away at this plant that is growing. Yeah. And the other thing that I mentioned today and I forgot to ask Nate about is that he told me that he had grown a potato, like somehow the potato had taken off and it had roots across the entire enclosure. Wow. I am so interested in that. Like, yeah. I think that is so cool. I will put potatoes in all of my enclosures. So um, let me ask you something on the carrots. Yeah. Um, so I, I was, I've been, again, just conversation with people, different, different ideas coming up. I've heard that if you feed your roaches, like discoid roaches, too many carrots, and then you feed them to your reptiles. Now I know you're not feeding your, your eyes buds to your reptiles, but just, you know, on the train of thought, if you feed them to reptile, it can cause like, uh, I believe it's hypervitaminosis or uh, excess in maybe vitamin A. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Really? Yeah. Um, and supposedly it's not good for the reptiles or the roaches. Do you think that this could be something to be concerned See, about? Maybe I'm doing spots? these things wrong, to be honest. And I, and I am willing to admit that like, no, there's there always the possibility that I am doing something wrong. Because like, if, if I do anything wrong with isopods, is that some species I'm keeping a bit too wet yeah. and I might be overfeeding. Yeah. So if I'm slowly poisoning my isopods, crap, but I have not seen that yet. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, and, 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 it could, and it could not affect them in the same way, right? Like who knows? Yeah, yeah, no, and that's true. And that's really interesting. That is something that I am definitely going to look into mm -hmm. because honestly, I don't deal with like shrimp. You don't see too many health problems, but sometimes you do. Mm -hmm. I've never seen a health problem out of an isopod. No, well, yeah. Like yeah. they're just solid and then sometimes they die, mm -hmm. which happens. Right. So. Awesome. So, so basically, oh, well, actually, let me, let me ask you that. That's, that's a good point. Um, I sometimes will open a bin and just find one or two dead ones. Do you think this is something to be concerned about? Or do you think that eventually just some of them reach old age and just die off? And I definitely it's a think. Colony that's yeah, exactly. Some of them are, are going to die just like, like any, any small animal. Like some of them just are naturally not going to make it as long as others. And some of them will become grandmas and grandpas yeah. and then pass away of a ripe old age. Right. If you see a bunch of them die at once, and especially if you see them all die in one place, like on a dry side or the wet side, then it's something to watch out for. So like if they, if you find them all huddled on the dry side, it means your enclosure is probably too wet. Right. If you find all the isopods on the wet side, then it's probably too dry, potentially. Right. 
Um, I am most comfortable when there's a few isopods everywhere. Everywhere, yeah. Um, that being said, like if you have all the isopods on the wet side, maybe they're all just shedding. I don't know. Yeah. But if you find a bunch of isopods dead at once, then I would try to figure that out. Question it a little bit. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Awesome. Okay, so we were on on the train of thought of of the diet and the food. So essentially, you're giving them fish food. You're giving them a bunch of different vegetables. Yeah. So and we already talked about you sort of supplementing them with limestone or calcium at other times. Yeah. Is there anything else that you give them or you find useful to give so them? So you've si said freeze dried and dried fish. Yes. That definitely. one is cool. One, because when they eat them, there's a little skeleton. Skeleton, yeah. The freeze dried minnows, they, and they all seem to take them really well. They do. Yeah. And James had talked about, like, you remember when we had, like, eyeballs? It was like... I do remember this. This was, um, I will tell you the company name too, uh, Vivariums in the Mist. Okay. That was the name of the brand. They had like a big fish ice pod. And they had freeze dried peas, all from the same company for isopod food. I remember yeah. this. Yeah. So like there might be something in eyeballs. That yeah. They, that, that they like. Is important yeah. for them. Do you remember what kind of fish it was? What kind of fish eyeballs it was? I feel like it was carp or something. Yeah, it maybe was like some farmed fish. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so that that is an interesting one. I'm not buying uh, eyeballs. I haven't <laughs> seen them in forever anyway. I haven't yeah. seen them either. But like, I think the eyeball of the freeze dried minnow is probably, it's probably good for them. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, fish food. I'm using the pellets. Fluval bug bites. Hashtag Fluval, sponsor me. <laughs> but, no, I should have made you wear the Fluval hat. <laughs> yeah, they're not going to sponsor me. <laughs> but um, I use Fluval bug bites just because I think it's a good thing. Um, and I then, use it for my discoid roaches, they eat it too. Yeah, no, it's, it's good stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then I use Rapashi. We all love Rapashi. Powder form or gel form? That's a big debate. Um, yeah, because I was I literally going to hit you with the powder question next. So, okay, answer that first and then, yeah. I make it into gels. You make it into gels. Yeah, I make it into gels. They're probably is fine to use the powder, but I just, for my fish, I'm making it into gels. So I'm using a type of community food, which is just a fish community plus. Community plus, yeah. yeah. And then I am using Rapashi morning wood. <laughs> like the one that everyone loves the name of. Yeah, it says on the bottle, for fish that like to suck on hard wood in the morning. Does it actually? Yes. No way. Yeah, I had no idea. <laughs> uh, they, make a, they make a morning wood for isopods. And at one point I thought they were different. I thought I read that the fiber was higher on the isopod one. But I think recently I've looked at them both and maybe they changed the formula. Maybe I just had a hallucination. I think they're the same. They're the same thing, yeah, yeah. from what so I understand. Yeah. I buy a, the giant tub of fish morning wood. Mm -hmm. And morning wood is interesting because it is like cellulose. So it's like, it's almost wood -y. It It has the components, some components of wood, which they, they eat in the wild. So I use a fishy one that has more protein, I would say. It has like krill and black soldier fly larva and all yeah. those things in it, yeah. And then I use the morning wood, which I don't use for fish, but I do use for isopods. And I have seen a lot of people also using bug burger, the one that you're supposed to feed to crickets. I'm interested in that. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember from the store, I hate the smell of it. Yeah. It smells horrible. Yeah. I think the only one that smells worse to me is the hornworm one. Uh, or the fruit fly one. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, the fruit fly one's bad too, yeah. Yeah, but uh, those are the two that I use. Um, okay, so I hear a lot, and the reason I asked you if you make it as a gel or a powder, but I've heard this multiple times, and I can't remember this where I heard it. It may have been just a YouTube video about feeding isopods, but they what they do is they try to feed more powdered foods because what they said, I believe, was that the babies... It's easier for the mankai or the babies to access the powdered food and they don't have to break it down. They can kind of just grab a piece and run with it and it's less competition for them. And they found that similar to what we were talking about with shrimp where, you know, we were saying like powdered foods kind of increases yield of the, of the, of the younger ones. I believe the person, whoever it was, was saying, yeah, that the, they're, they're, they get bigger booms of isopod babies when they're feeding more powdered food versus harder foods. That is very interesting. Hmm. Um, if that's the case, I'll start doing it next week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so Tonight. I'll, I will look into that because yeah, yeah. I am interested in having the babies do as well as possible. Mm -hmm. I think the benefit, one of the major benefits of powdered food in an aquarium is that it goes everywhere. around everywhere. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, whereas 
the powder, depending on where you put it, might just sink into the substrate. That goes in, the next part is like how to feed them. I usually will put the food onto a leaf. Yeah, dude, um, okay, so I used to have this problem where I would feed on the wet side. No, I would feed on the dry side, but I would put it on the soil and then that entire area would mold out. So I started putting it on the leaf as well, but if the food, so this is what I, another reason I asked you gel versus powder, because I find that the gel will mold in 24 to 48 hours where the powder, as long as it's on the dry side and not touching any moisture will last a lot longer. Okay, so I don't know why, or like maybe I do know why, I don't get mold that often and I feed quite a bit and I think it's because I have so many springtails. Or a lot of uh, ventilation. Not on all of them. No. And like, so you, you, yeah, that makes sense, but I don't run into mold very often, I think, because I have just a lot of spring panels. Um, but yeah, people will say, do not put it directly onto a wet surface. Yeah. That makes sense. I, I, have, I can definitely vouch for this. Yeah. I put the carrot on a wet surface directly. But yeah. And I, cause I want it to basically become a plant. Yeah. But their uh, house plant. Yeah. yeah. Their house plant. Their, their damn house plant that they're always eating. Um, but, uh, yeah, what I've been trying to do now, like, uh, I've heard one of the rep, one of the breeders, one of the old school breeders of isopods, he'd say that he would get, like, he would basically hollow out a cuddle bone and put it on a cuddle bone. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, Actually, that's another thing I used to do. Um, so eggshells, I used to give them crushed eggshells and then I would start, you know, when you like crack an eggshell, you get two halves. Yep. So I started putting the, like, I'd get a bunch of different halves and each isopod tank had a half and I would feed in the half. Yep, like, so the, these things make sense. I, I just find, like, a leaf is easier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, like, only put it on, like, an oak leaf or a magnolia leaf, like, something that's, like, really durable. Yeah. But the leaf is flat and allows easy access to everyone. Yeah. And then, like, going into, like, accessibility. Like, some people will say that babies and mothers and stuff like that, they won't don't want to go far for food. So, like, if I see a group of babies, I'm going to feed near them. I right. never put food under a hide, Yeah. but I put it right beside it. And you put multiple feeding stations or just one? I put multiple feeding stations uh, because like some of them are probably going to be super bold and go wherever. Yeah. Um, but I put multiple feeding stations so that it's just easy for them. This is me babying things again, mm -hmm. um, but... But you're extremely successful with them. So clearly the babying is working, yeah. right? Yeah. No, and, I, and I think with, it makes sense. Like. I see, I, I don't know, like if, when the when the tanks are pitch black, I'm not typically looking through them, but like say these Bolivari babies, they have been in one place for the entire time they've been alive. Mm -hmm. So I think that there is an explanation, a good explanation for, or a good reason why you should put it close to babies and potentially on both sides of the terrarium. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and like a couple other things I've heard some people will use like raw cardboard, so the stuff that eggshells actually eggs come in. I've uh, seen this as well. Without yeah. any like ink or anything like that. Yeah. I don't like it because it it does get moldy. Yeah. Like I have seen that like develop like the sort of blacky mold, black <clears throat> mold, and I I don't like that. Um, I don't use it that much. Um, and then another one that is real good if you have access to it is shed. Yeah, snake shed. Yeah, snake shed or for lizard sure. Shed, shed if you can get your lizard shed, like they usually eat it. Yeah, but yeah, um, snake shed. So what I do with my snakes, if I see a nice when I see shed, like a nice big piece of shed, I'll take it out. I will dry the crap, dry it out real good, primarily so that none of the isopods, if there are baby isopods or whatever in the shed, that they don't go in. Plus anything else, I don't know. And then I rip up pieces and put it into the isopod bins. Some of them devour the shed like mm -hmm. crazy. I don't know what it is about it. And the other thing is that I don't tend to see them eating the belly shed of the snake. Like the the belly. Scales I was. Are yeah, big. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I was gonna tell you it's almost like they eat between the scales and they leave the individual scales, right? Yeah. Like well, definitely. Like the belly of a snake is like big plates mm -hmm. or I, i'm talking about pythons at least yeah, yeah. I think a lot of them like the scales on the top are smaller and softer yeah and like a lot of my spanish species and even like some of my small cubaris species they'll just prioritize shed almost every over yeah. everything 
that not everybody has access to shed, but if you happen to have a snake, or you have a friend that has a snake, so that I would doesn't put collect their shed. Yeah. I'd, I'd put in a bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is there any foods that you've heard or you know of that you would recommend? Well, so when you said when you said the eyeballs, you got me thinking of vivariums in the mist, and they had like a whole different lines of um, uh, isopod food, and mm -hmm. I found that they actually seem to be fairly attracted to. Like, you know how you said they picked the shed over. Um, most other things, I found that usually anything that I've tried from that brand, and I haven't seen it around in a while, um, able to, but so that some of the things were, again, the eyeballs, there was the freeze-dried freeze peas, which I found they went for immediately, um, spirulina they love, um, and um, uh, there was a, I, they're like sticks, uh, I think they were called like isopod grub or something, mm -hmm. they're little like sticks, and you you put them into the soil, and uh they used to go for those really well as well. Uh, but I, I, I also find that, and I find this with the discoid roaches as well, I don't know if this makes sense or not, but I find that they get bored of certain things over time. Like if you keep feeding the the freeze-dried minnows, eventually they start to not go for them as fast. And I feel like they do like that variety as well. Yeah, no, and I, I, like to, I do like to rotate. Like I'm not giving everything to them every, every time. Every time, no, for like, sure, yeah. Like I'll, I'll always give them vegetables because I always have vegetables. But like one week I'll give them freeze-dried, one freeze-dried minnows. One week I'll give them uh, like the bug bites. Mm -hmm. I always give them morning wood. But uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say rotation and keeping it is, fresh is, is good for them. Definitely. And there was uh, one other thing. Um, um, it's another type of fish food. It's like, I don't know what, if, krill or tiny shrimp, yeah. whatever it is. Yeah, and they love that too. Like yeah. Zoomed Red River Shrimp. Something, Something like that. Yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> that, I, I've been meaning to get my hands on that. It's just, I try to keep the money that I put into these things as low as possible. No, for sure. <laughs> so yeah, like, yeah. I'm buying a giant tub of Fluval Bug Bites. Like, and that, I, I, I buy the giant tubs of Rapashi. Um, if you're feeding one isopod, one a couple enclosures, then that's fine. But forty enclosures to buy that super fancy isopod food, it's it, it, difficult. No, definitely it doesn't make sense. I'm yeah. sure it would be awesome. Yeah. But uh, just like I was talking to um, La Swamp. Yeah. And he was talking about in his mix, he's putting like, I don't want to misquote him, but I think he said like chicken broth. Wow. Okay. Uh, so there's a lot of cool stuff. But, yeah. Uh, I, I have not done that. I, I do like the fancy foods, um, but I don't use a lot of it because I just don't want to be spending a million dollars yeah. on these things. Yeah. And I will also say there are um, recipes online. Mm -hmm. If you're if you looking at them, I know uh, uh, mostly just geckos, I think out in BC, and um, Wally Kern from Supreme Gecko, and um, uh, Russ from Aquarium Max. They all have their own like version of this isopod food, which funny enough, they are all powdered by the way. So maybe there is something about this powder that we should look into, but, um, and there are a bunch of different, not spices, like powdered seeds and all these different things that they put into it. And it seems to really, really do the trick. So yeah. Like one reason why it might be powdered is just so that they can blend it all together. Uh, but yeah. no, I'm gonna dehydrated look. like Rapashi. It could, yeah, it yeah. could absolutely. I'm, be. I'm gonna look into that. Yeah, that might be a game changer. Okay, so we're gonna keep going, but you guys are gonna have to wait till next week to hear the rest of this episode. This was Isopods Part One with the incredible Theo Nature State Seven. Make sure you give him a follow on Instagram. The um, his Instagram link will be in the show notes. But we are going to cut it here, and I'm gonna tease you guys and make you wait to hear Isopods Part Two, which, by the way is the better part. So you make sure you come back for that. And uh, yeah. Don't go nowhere. Don't go nowhere. We'll be right back. <laughs> yeah, thank you all for watching. We will see you in part two.